Welcome to this afternoon's work session. First order of business. Well, while we, before we get to first order of business, I would like to introduce to everybody our new assistant clerk. She's not exactly new because she's been around for about a month or two now. Uh, Tahi, Tani, Tahisha. Did I say that right? King. Tanisha King. So please give a round of applause at the welcome. Her. All right, next order of business is if any of the commissioners would like to discuss any of the preliminary items for next week's regular business meeting. I'm sorry? Oh, okay. No. All right, here and now we're going to go straight into our work session. First one is Strive Atlanta Update. Uh, President and CEO of Aerotropolis Atlanta, Mr. Shannon James. Good afternoon. And you are not Shannon James. <laughs> no, so I am not. Here. So please introduce yourself to us. That was the first announcement. Um, I'm Jamal Vales, the executive director of Strive Atlanta. I've been before you all. I'm glad to be back. Shannon may be en route. So is it possible to wait, or do you want me to? No, let's proceed. OK. Then if you can scroll to the fifth slide. <laughs> We wanted to come back to extend our deepest gratitude for your investment and support in what was an amazing workforce development pilot that we did in partnership with, obviously, Clayton County and the North Clayton um, High School through Superintendent uh, Smith. And we just wanted to give, come back and give you all a recap of what was done, how those funds have helped move the needle towards those shared objectives that you shared around providing opportunities of economic mobility for your residents. With me today is Program Director Toya Williams, as well as one of our graduates and Cle Cle residents of Clayton County, Brittany Irvin, who will also give just a few moments. Any questions, by all means, ask, but I'll go through. If we can scroll. Next slide, thank you. So we began a year and a half ago, conversation with this body, to bring forth what would be a workforce pilot that we did in partnership with you all and public schools of Clayton County. We did uh, a mighty job over the course of three and a half months. And so we'll just walk you through some of the activity, answer any questions you may have, and then hopefully plant the seed for what may be continued support as we look towards FY25. All right, so I am Toya Williams. I'm the program director uh, with Strive Atlanta. Um, so what you see here is that we first had five info sessions in Clayton County. And so thank you to Ms. Rice and to Ms. Gill for securing spots that we could actually do our info sessions. So they secured the Virginia um, Recreation Center and also the Clayton County uh, local libraries. Um, from those five info sessions, you all did a phenomenal job because they made sure they put up flyers within the local libraries, um, actually discussed our program um, at board uh, meetings as well. So we received 63 interest forms, um, and from those 63, we had 30 applications. That's typically the trend that we normally see, half of the interest forms actually turn into applications. Um, from there, we had 21 um, participants to come to orientation. Orientations where they find out about the program, find out about the expectations, and if they truly are dedicated to actually committing to the program. Um, during that time, we found that some of the participants maybe uh, had a conflict of time, um, had other things going on, travel as well, um, so we end up enrolling a total of 15. Um, and some of the zip codes that our 15 came from was 30274, 30326, 30298, and 30236. Next slide. Just to give you a perspective on um, who enrolled in the program, we don't have to read every data point, but by and large, this was completely Clayton residents. We had five young adults who were in that 18 to 24 demographic. The rest were older, which is typical in our Strive cohorts, a mixed bag of both young adults as well as those adults who are looking to re-enter the workplace or advance. We had some who were justice involved, and we partnered with a few entities on their supports. 
Um, we had parents. None of our participants were parents with 17 children. So noting those supportive services, those needs to be able to support the full wraparound was a big piece of what we were able to do. Um, our cohort was split. We offered two, a logistics pathway as well as an office administration pathway. And the cohort was pretty much split with eight in logistics and eight eight in logistics and seven in office admin. That's representative of, of our typical work, that those pathways are aligned with the interests of community and the employer partners that we've been able to establish are primed and ready for those, those residents as well. We were 100% black and people of color. We know those typically disenfranchised, not connected to those opportunities. And so once again, Strava is able to open the door to those residents providing free tuition certifications that are expensive to those who are not working that we were able to do in support and with support from this body. Next slide, please. Um, so out of the 15, we had an 87% graduation rate. Um, out of the 87, typically what happens there, if they do not complete hard skills, because they cannot miss, right, um, the graduation rate will drop. Um, we had 32 certifications. Now that sounds a little weird because we have 15 participants, but the 32 certification comes from the opportunity for our participants to receive four certifications, um, one in OSHA 10, logistics, inventory management control, and um, certified logistics associate and forklift operation, I'm sorry. Um, and out of our 32, well, out of our um, participants who graduated, we did 84% job placement. Um, and so with the typical hourly rate starting off at 1935, and what I can say is the majority of our participants who actually started the program, I think it was like maybe 92% were unemployed at the time. So this was a great gain for us. And we wanted to make sure that we heightened that data because this body has pointed questions about the data on the front end to, <coughs> to even engage in the partnership. We were very pleased to receive the re data that you've been here, and we look forward to building more. That wage of, of 1935, again, for those who came in unemployed, it's a new job. For those that came in employed, we're in the 12 to $14 range. So we're speaking to either way, sub substantive increase in wages that helps support that collective goal that we have around economic mobility, self-sufficiency, in the home. Next slide. Wanted to share you a series of the ecosystem that we've developed. One of your pointed questions was, who else is supporting this? While we are on board and we want to do this, we don't want to be the sole entity. And so we were able to generate additional support from United Way of Greater Atlanta that has identified Clayton as one of their, in the well-being index, one of those communities of need. And so there was an allocation of funding that United Way allowed us to provide to this cohort. You'll see our training partners of Atlanta Tech and Chattahoochee Tech, again, of no course to participants, but we were able to underwrite those costs of tuition so that the program was completely free. I think the last time I was here, so was the CEO of MARTA, who I acknowledge as one of our partners. We provide transportation via gas card as well as MARTA cards to every student the whole way through training and even after, because we know those first couple of weeks on the job before you get that check, and even after you get that check, transportation is something that costs, and we were able to do that at no cost. At the bottom, you'll see Chase Bank, which is one of our financial services partners, as well as Lisk Atlanta, all of whom have a vested interest in the success of Clayton County. So when we came to them showing the support, it allowed us to grow that to provide additional support. And we look forward to doing the same as we move forward. One more slide. Well, maybe two. Uh, so the, the last slide here we have um, before we make our introduction is that we have a list of our um, partners um, for solutions, Lowe's, Home Depot, Caterpillar, Kohl's, DHL, um, Georgia, you all can see them. Um, and as you see, our name is up there as well, um, Strive Atlanta. And we're happy to add our names to the list because for the first time we were able to host an intern. And so our intern is here today um, to speak on her experience at Strive, um, also um, her invested uh, I don't know what to say right now. I'm just going to let her speak. <laughs> <laughs> and this is Brittany. Hello, everyone. My name is Brittany Irvin, and I am a Strive alum. Um, my experience with Strive, honestly, it was amazing. Like, to be honest, I had just graduated from Clayton State University, and I was kind of lost, didn't know what was next for me. So this opportunity was presented to me by my mom. Actually, she gets emails about things going on in Clayton County. So she sent it to me, never heard of it before, did my research, and it was showing that it was in Atlanta. So I was kind of like, I'm not sure. 
But then when I went to the info session, because it was around the corner from where I reside, they were telling us it would be at, you know, North Clayton and we'll provide gas cards and X, Y, and Z to help you get to the school so you can have the opportunity with Strive. So I did it, showed up on time. It was like going to a job. It was nine to five. So I showed up. I gave it my best. It really helped me build that confidence. It helped me learn the skills that I already have that I didn't even realize. Oh, you have those skills that you can put on your resume. So it actually helped me enhance my resume. And because I did so well, I did have the opportunity to be an intern at Strive, which just pushed me even further. Um, the support they have given me at Strive is nonstop. Every even when I was an intern there every day, are you sure you're okay? Do you need anything? Are you good? They care so much, they pour their heart into that program, and it was amazing to be on both ends to see how it operates and see what it takes for them to provide it to the community. So, I'm grateful for the program, it has truly changed my life. I'm thankful to them and all the support they give me, even now that I'm no longer an intern. Um, so yes, I appreciate it. I'm thankful that you all brought it to Clayton County because if it wasn't, I was not going to Atlanta to do it. So I'm grateful for it. So thank you. <laughs> All right. uh, so oh. any questions that? Well, I was just going to say y'all owe this lady a check because she you is know, on it. And she we is didn't get for, we didn't get her talking points for what you do. And, and it's definitely a great program. I, have, I only have one question. That is, Sir. you stated in one of your slides you had an 84 uh, percent placement rate correct what challenges or issue if any did you have why we're not at 100 percent? and i know nothing's really 100 but did you have yeah. any challenges 100 percent is aspirational for us mm -hmm. as always right um 80 percent is strives typical placement rate so we were north of that at 84 percent there are some who are still in the pipeline, some who are in interviews as we speak, who are talking to staff, working through that process. 84 for us, as a first time venture, I think let us come back to see how can we close that gap so we can get in the 90s and yes, to 100 one day, that remains our aspiration. But I don't know that I would speak to challenges as much as providing the opportunity to our employer partners to present a pipeline of trained, certified, ready to go residents who have the intrinsic skill and motivation to move forward. Um, so our employer partners that we brought to the fold, we already knew them. For us, it's about building out that ecosystem. Who are the additional employer partners that we don't know? Who lives in and around proximity to Clayton that would want to benefit from a host of Clayton residents who are trained and certified. That takes a bit of work. That's part of the conversations that we are building between Aerotropolis and myself and others as we are building out that pipeline so that the eight employers who you see here, yes, they took a chance. They know us. They've done that. What we want to have at the next time we come back is a full page of employer partners who are lined up and ready to go. That's going to take a collaborative process. Strive isn't going to do that alone. We're going to do that in partnership here. But the fact that we were able to do this in three months without any investment in Clayton County, we didn't know Clayton. We know it a bit more. We still want to know the spots, um, you know, where folks are, where we can touch residents. You were super helpful, Commissioner Hamburg. I can't tell you how much. Saying your name, open doors. There were some folks who literally said, no, you can't do this here. When we said Commissioner Hamburg is involved, literally the doors open. And so what we want the next go around is to be able to speak to all of the commissioners so we can show the collective feedback as well as the input from this body. Good, good, good. Yes, Commissioner. Uh, yes, what's your name? Brittany Irvin. Brittany, so what are you doing now? Uh, right now, well, I just actually finished my internship. Okay. So I am in the process of doing applications. Um, I did work at the employer assistance office in Clayton County for about three months. Um, and then I have a conversation with the internship on it. So I am, you know, applying. I've been hearing back from some places, so I have some interviews lined up. So I'm hopeful. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Doing great. Right. Did you include uh, Clayton County government? In yes. your okay, <laughs> <laughs> right. Right. and what other areas uh, are you all working in? Uh, Strive in terms of path industries, yes, logistics. So, the entire distribution, supply chain, manufacturing, logistics space the bulk of our employers in that Caterpillar DHL have 
plants within the Clayton footprint as well as in close proximity to the Aerotropolis region. And then office administration is a broader umbrella. So it's really the space for general operations, general administration. And Brittany was named and chosen by her cohort to speak at her graduation. She won't say that because she's so humble <laughs> and sweet. So there was really no doubt when we said this can't end at graduation. We, Brittany was our first paid intern of Strive Atlanta. And we've been op in operations for three and a half years and have never paid an intern. We've had interns, we've given a few weeks, but we said we have to do this to support and invest in you so that you can take some more things into your next. Again, she won't speak to that, but Brittany was a no brainer. Um, and so the fact that she is from Clayton, again, this is not manufactured, we didn't, there was no talking points. We didn't have a debrief beforehand. She said, absolutely, I'll be there so that they know this matters and we need it again. Okay. Great, great. Any other counties that you all are working out of? We are uh, planning right now an East Point cohort that will launch in September. Um, City Council in East Point, again, having seen what we've done here. And we've partnered in East Point before. Shannon can speak to that. But City Council has approved a two-year MOU so that for two years we are partnering with them. Um, that training will take place at the East Point City Hall Annex. And so, again, you know, we are open to partnering with community to bring the work closer to you all. Um, as, as Brittany said, she wasn't coming to Atlanta, not that it's super far, but the fact that it was next door in the community where she knows and thrives and lives, that's what we want to do to eliminate that gap so that that's not a reason why you don't show up. Mm -hmm. it's, it's in your community, from your community. It was really great. Are you all going to continue in Clayton? So Superintendent Smith absolutely wants us there. He's like, let me know how much space you need, how many offices. We're not sure. We're building that partnership. But um, what we've done with North Clayton High School has been amazing for their career in um, academy. So we're building out what that looks and feels like moving forward. We see Clayton as, as a home base, okay. for sure. Thank you all, too. Thank you. Mr. Do you have something? Oh, yes. I've got a few questions. Um, uh, well, thank you for this. Oh, goodness. Thank you for this presentation. Um, I was just curious about uh, the timeline between uh, the, info, the info sessions, the interest, like the interest forms that were completed by participants, and the actual uh, program. Like, what, what was that timeline? How many? How many? Typically, we do about two months of community engagement to really penetrate a neighborhood, a community, and so those info sessions happened over the course of a month and a half. Um, typically in the evening, we did do, I think, three or four um, virtual sessions during the day. We had more visibility and traffic from community residents at, in the evening. I won't say that's because we fed and had pizza and drinks, but um, that definitely worked out in terms of those two months of connection. The next month and a half is what we call engaged enrollment. You can fill out an interest form, but then if the next training doesn't start until a month and a half from there, what do we do in that interim? And so for engaged enrollment for us is when our career coach will have conversations, we'll do our initial assessments, we'll see what it is that you need and what we can do, what barriers that we can mitigate so that you can do the program with no challenges. That month and a half is a great month and a half because we get to know you before you even come into class. Day one is not day one of class, it's really day one when you submit that, um, that interest form. And then the training is six and a half weeks. Um, there are three weeks of soft skills, we call that START. It's success through attitude readiness training. And then we have three weeks of hard skills training. That's certification bearing, that's those nationally recognized, industry recognized certifications that um, are expensive and that typically students would, wouldn't be able to do for free if not for Strive Atlanta. That six, six week, six and a half week window is typically the training window of start. And then that's really for us, not the culmination. It's not the end, it's the springboard to this next journey. So as you saw Brittany, yes, she graduated. Yes, she spoke at graduation, it was great. Um, and then she had our six weeks of paid internship in our office. The team is upset that that six weeks has come to an end. So should anyone want to um, continue that? Let's talk about it. But ultimately, it was really a springboard to her next. And so she is actively involved with our employment specialist identifying that next opportunity that will help her get into we're not helping I mean she'll get into it and be able to say that she has uh, participated in Strive Atlanta's program thank you uh, you're welcome I, 
I see DeKalb County uh, listed as one of the employer partners, and I'm just curious about, uh, and I'm, I'm going to throw the new card since I'm new here, about like what, what has their relationship been sure. uh, with, with Clayton County, but also with uh, some of the other, especially like logistics and manufacturing sure. companies headquartered in Clayton County. It's twofold. So engagement doesn't necessarily mean I have hired a Stravalanta graduate, but our employer partners participate in mock interviews all throughout the program so that they are preparing them, not from our staff, but from those who are hiring managers in the industry of logistics so that when they get out, they're speaking the language, they know the nomenclature, and they can tout those new certifications that they've got in order to position them and help equalize that opportunity for them. Um, although on this list, Caterpillar, yes, we just had a recent hire, over 20 an hour, which is beautiful. Um, we have an employee at Lowe's on the forklift. So he's not the cashier, he's literally using the certification that we all that he just got through this program as a forklift operator for Lowe's same with for, with Home Depot and even the Georgia Aquarium which people don't think the way you move things under the aquarium is on the forklift and so the fact that our graduates have that certification is something that the aquarium has loved we have three employees now at the aquarium. So they're engaged, both in mock interviews, they also sit on an employer council, so they tell us what are we seeing in the workplace that you can build into your program so that you're sending us candidates who, who are primed and ready to go. It's, it's an amazing relationship that we have where yes, hiring happens as well, but it really is informing us of what to do so that we're not just doing a program that we think makes sense, we're doing a program that employers have said, this is what we need and this is how candidates stand apart. So that's to answer your employer partner question. Um, DeKalb County is a new partnership that we just established, really developed last year. It's tied to their office administration pathway. And so there are a host of jobs within DeKalb County government um, that our in graduates are interviewing for. Um, they, they were at graduation. None of you were able to attend, but um, they were at graduation and remain an important partner. So as we're building out the uh, office admin pathway, we have more ready to go employers in the logistics space because of clearly they're concentrated in this, in this um, region. Office administration is more for those who are looking to upskill and take what they've learned into a new space. Thank you. Okay, one last question. Yeah. It's actually for Ms. Irving, because I see our president of Clayton State University in the room. <laughs> I was just curious, uh, what, what was your major when you graduated from Clayton State? Administration. Okay, you graduated with the business administration. Yes. Okay. <laughs> Congratulations. Thank you. All right, Mr. Uh, James, good to see you. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. My apologies on my tardiness, uh, other commissioners and staff. I just wanted to really reinform you guys about the work we've been doing on Blueprint 2.0, and of course to brag on Strive ATL. Um, there are four slides, I think, at the beginning of the presentation. My, my apologies, but really I want to just uh, highlight really quickly the work of Strive ATL is the result of your economic and workforce development strategy uh, that was adopted in 2022, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, the Aerotropolis participated in that program and Strive ATL was identified through the process. Uh, two years later, now we're in implementation. So I want to thank you uh, for your leadership. And just so you know, we're not just allowing your studies to sit on a shelf, right? We are implementing. And so speaking of shelves, right, and studies, uh, we're working really hard to close out the gap on Blueprint 2.0. I wanted to make sure to get before the Board of Commissioners to help you guys continue to connect the dot on some of the sites that we've identified which were through data analytics, uh, conversations with key stakeholders. And so we've identified three sites that we want to bring before you just so that you're aware of what we're working on. Uh, we're, again, these are conceptual ideas, right? The final product may not even look like this, right? But at least conceptually, the idea is how do we get to this finished product? And so uh, one of the sites identified was 5711 Jonesboro Road. Uh, it sits between Lake City and Morrow. It was a lot of conversation back and forth about this site. There's a lot of history on this site. Uh, we've talked with uh, Clayton State University. The president is back there. Uh, we've talked with major stakeholders, of course, both City of Morrow and Lake City, the county, uh, business owners. And what we're hearing consistently is no question mixed use. Uh, this idea of retail, multifamily, maybe townhome, condo, if you will, concept. Student housing continued to raise up uh, in our conversations a lot. That was really interesting. And our conversations with Clayton State University have been encouraging. 
And so, as well as flex innovate, innovative and research space, so R&D, if you will. And so this is high level conceptually of what our consultants put together. Uh, the idea is how do we at least conceptually envision what this space could look like? And this is ultimately what we've come to, which is uh, we're looking at industry as well, healthcare, life sciences, bio life sciences continue to be one of those dialogues around industry for this space, but retail. Uh, we continue to hear retail, but in regards to retail, those rooftops have to align themselves. So that's why you're seeing the multifamily or in essence townhome condo type concept. Um, next slide. Dixie Road. Uh, this site continues to raise to the top, honestly. Uh, this is Terra Boulevard. It's right at that intersection. Tons of ingress, egress. I don't have to tell you guys about this site. Um, I've had several conversations with Commissioner Davis about this location. And <clears throat> through this research, uh, we uncovered a lot. Uh, retail mixed use seems to be the consensus. Uh, we're not too pressed on the fast food piece. We feel like there's a big presence there, uh, but there's obviously an opportunity. But multifamily, townhome, condo uh, is what we're hearing, what we're seeing. But there, there is a high push for rooftops, retail. So this idea of a mixed use type of concept. Uh, healthcare life sciences, again, raised to the top. Uh, I think the proximity to Southern Regional in this location with the idea of BRT, the transit that's coming, uh, there's a lot of synergies there. Uh, there's also the vision of the Flint River Gateway Trails coming south. So there's a lot of synergies in this area and it created a lot of excitement. So much so that I do believe this site parallels with the Terra Boulevard study. It's one of the catalytic sites from the Terra Boulevard study. Next slide. Next slide. Mountain View. Uh, the final site is Mountain View. We, we've had a long journey with Mountain View, right? Um, Chairman Turner, I see you rocking your head. You know, it was no question uncovered through our partnership originally with the original blueprint uh, of how do we start to work through Mountain View. And now this idea of what OA development has brought Commissioner Hambrick is now catapulted momentum. And so what we continue to hear was this kind of mixture of feedback from stakeholders. Uh, one is this high interest for industrial uh, to push along the front side of uh, Dick, uh, I'm sorry, this is Mountain View, uh, Conley Road. So there was this, we're hearing this real big push for industrial, but we hear this huge aspiration for retail uh, and entertainment. And so what, we're, what we came to the conclusion was that what, we, what we've heard from the commission, what we've heard from stakeholders, is that there is this idea that this front side of the development should be leaned more towards flex office, retail, entertainment. So we, we did not push and elevate industrial, as you can see, uh, and we've conceptually tried to put together an idea of what that could potentially look like. And honestly, we're, we're getting some feedback. Uh, we're starting to get some interest, and it's, it's starting to slowly unravel now that we're kind of starting to take a position, right? Not just, it's, we, we, we've heard this is the vision. Uh, next slide, please. I just want to hit you guys with some information, right? Um, I know the team is over here to the right. What's going on? Uh, we've been working hard, guys. Seriously, I, we, it may not be above board, but man, that is, that is a hard working group. Uh, we've been meeting weekly. We've been talking daily. So much so that we're excited that the zoning rewrite is getting close, right? We're getting ready to get that piece moving. Uh, but And it, it's so important, but we also have the comp plan moving. We've got Terra Boulevard wrapping up. We've got Blueprint 2.0. So there's a lot of plans, a lot of studies, but the zoning rewrite is really going to target us for development. And so we're excited about hosting Moving Clayton Ford. So much interest now. We're at the Martha Ellen Steelwell School of the Performing Arts. We're at roughly 185 registered participants. So the region is coming to hear Clayton. Uh, I think we've pulled all of our key stakeholders in the county to work with us, to participate. Thank you, Chairman. I think you're bringing the intro for Dr. Smith. And so we're really excited about resetting uh, the narrative and pushing forward the vision for the county after this event. Uh, so I just wanted to make sure everyone was aware that it is coming up. Next slide. And at this event, we're excited to unveil Terra Boulevard. You know, this has been a lot of discussion. There's been a lot of dialogue back and forth. Uh, I am encouraged by this document. 
Uh, we've identified three catalytic areas within the boulevard. We've got this aspirational strategy uh, that is ambitious that the Aerotropolis, we will, we will not let it go. Um, we're going to hold on to this like a baby. And uh, our hope is that our aspirations come to fruition. With that, I'll yield for any questions. Well, you've been doing a lot of work, and you are correct. Staff has definitely been on it, and mm -hmm. they've been hitting us up and letting us know that, hey, what is the vision for these areas and what we'd like to see. And, of course, it will be uh, citizen-driven. That's right. And this is really what's needed here in Clayton County. Anybody have any questions well, for? the location for the, um, with Ms. Roach? I think. Uh, yes. Um, did that change? It did. We were originally at Clayton State. We're now at Martha Ellen Steelwell School of Performing Arts. Performing Arts. Mm -hmm. okay. At the, uh, that building, that separate. Performing Arts. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Got Thank more, you. more participants wanting right. to come. So. Oh, yeah. We got a lot of interest. Mm -hmm. Anybody else? Well, thank you for your presentation. Thank you for all the work that you're doing here, thank specifically you. here in Clayton County. I know you've got an area to cover, but you're definitely committed to Clayton County, and I appreciate that. I thank you, Dr. Turner. Sh shameless plug for Strive ATL again. They mentioned East Point. They're across from Martell Homes, all right? So I just want to make sure I make that public. Thank and you. And thanks, Strive, for the work that you're doing uh, as well. Thank you for the program. Thank you. <laughs> All right, let's move on to Clayton State University strategic plan. Dr. Lewis. Yeah. Officer Swan. Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. Chairman Turner. Good to see each and every one of you today. Thank you for uh, giving us a few moments to uh, share uh, some information about the, uh, about the past, the, the uh, present, as well as the future at Clayton State University. And so we're thankful to have just a few moments uh, for this opportunity. Um, again, my name is uh, George Lewis, and I have been at Clayton State uh, since February of 2023 and have been running full speed ever since that time. So, go to the next slide, please. Just a little bit to share about the history. Um, of course, we were founded in 1969, so we're 55 years old. And four years later, I'm sorry, uh, in 1986, we became a four-year institution. Um, athletics came in 1990. Uh, Spivey Hall had our first concert in 1991. In 1996, we offered um, advanced degrees, so associates, uh, bachelor's, and master's degrees. and in, in 2005, we became, moved from Clayton State College University to Clayton State University. Uh, we started out with less than 1,000 students, and on the next slide, you'll see where we were at as of last year. And so you see some numbers up there. The first is student-faculty ratio. It says 22 to 1, but you know, it means most of our classes are relatively small and manageable. Um, I'm glad to say that next number is incorrect because uh, that was fall of 2023. We were at 58.81, and so we are, we are on our climb back to pre-pandemic numbers. So we have a few years, but we are moving in that direction. As of today, uh, we had uh, 6,312 students, so we're moving in the right direction. Some things have to settle out before the end of the semester so that number will be a little lower than that but it's going to be an increase this uh, if that increase occurs it will be the fourth consecutive semester that there's been an increase um, uh, we're approaching uh, 60 degrees and, and and we just added a a new one that i'll talk a little bit about later it's an active institution so 50 student organizations um, uh, division two athletics i always get the question uh, do we have football um, and and I can answer that in a in an asterisk kind of way uh, we we have it as a club sport it is not an NCAA division two sport so it is a club sport and and so we will have football this year and actually uh, collaborating with um, uh, Dr. Smith and his team at the Clayton County School District uh, they'll be playing uh, at Morrow High School and so we're so we're happy to do that next slide um, how we look uh, at Clayton State, our, our students are a little older when people think of college students. Sometimes they think of 18 to 22 year olds, but our students are, uh, the average age is 24. We have, a, we have a good group of 18 year olds, but we also have folks who come back to school and we're glad to have a good diverse mix of students in age. 
Uh, many of our students are, are low income. You see 77% of our first time, full time students are, are Pell Grant recipients. Um, a number that might mean more to people is the adjusted gross income, the average adjusted gross income for a family at Clayton State University is, is less than $29,000. And, and I say that because we make, I mean, there is a transformation when students graduate because their potential uh, is, is exponentially greater as a result of, that, of them having that degree. And so, um, so we're proud to meet students where there are, but lead them uh, to, where, to where they want to go. Next slide. Um, just want to share some, some recent uh, acknowledgments. I mentioned that I want to talk a little bit about the past, and we have. And so I've been on campus about a year and a half, and I just have a, a few <coughs> bullets to share. I could share a lot more. Um, but I mentioned earlier that uh, we are working on our fourth um, consecutive increase in enrollment uh, per semester. And so that would be um, uh, fall of 23, spring of 24 was a 5.1% increase. Uh, summertime, we have about a 3% increase and we're moving in the right direction for this fall as well. Uh, Pre-pandemic, uh, we were close to 7,000 students, so it's gonna take us a couple years to get there, but we're definitely moving, moving in that direction. Um, we had our, uh, our on-site visit um, from our accrediting agency, SAC COC, and, and the group came on campus in April, and when they left, we received zero recommendations, and so uh, it will not be official until December, but, but in December, um, if that zero still stands, in which, in which I think it will, we will be accredited for another 10 years, so that's great news for the institution. Um, our nursing program also got reaccredited um, throughout this year. We recently received a million dollars from Coca-Cola for first generation students. So we have four year scholarships for first generation students. I talked earlier about new programs. And so we won a, a RFP with the DeKalb County teacher residency program. And so we created a master of arts in teaching uh, program and, and students can enter that program and complete it in a year. And then they have a commitment back to that, to that county. Uh, and we're hoping that what we learn and our successes in that will help us uh, um, interact uh, more with uh, Clayton County on, on different types of options for, uh, uh, to close the gap. Um, there's a big gap, as you know, with, with uh, teachers. So um, uh, May, uh, May was great. We graduated about 450 students. We had uh, a great commencement ceremonies. And what I'm going to briefly talk to you about next is the uh, strategic plan launch. I mentioned I came on campus in uh, February of 2023. And so we worked with, um, you can go to the next slide. So we worked with um, faculty, uh, staff members, foundation board members, the school districts, business industry um, to develop our strategic plan. And so we worked with a consultant, a consulting group. The group's name was, was Huron. Uh, and so we'll, we'll start off with, and that may be hard for some to see, um, so what we came up with is, uh, so we have our values, our, our mission, and our vision. So the first value is adaptability. Um, as I talked about the history of Clayton State, we've always, we, we've always changed in order to meet the needs of, of our students in the community. Collaboration, um, we're, we're much better together then we are separate and so that's a value that we um, that we hold uh, excellence uh, that's being the best or working to be the best in everything we do integrity uh, comes without a question that's a you know that that is an expectation and and we're and our last value is people we want to be the best place for uh, faculty and staff to work and for our students to go to school uh, the uh, mission is on the other side of the page and our mission is pretty simple you have uh, if you read many um, institutions mission it's it's a page and a half and it has lots of lots of language but we really wanted to embrace um, something that we could repeat and that people would remember and so it's uh, so it's simple but i think it's focused on us our mission is social mobility we transform the lives of students through teaching scholarship and service it's about meeting meeting students where they are and helping them work towards where they um, where their goals are, as we kind of mentioned earlier. And our vision is, is around workforce development and providing uh, quality educational programs that meet the needs of our community. And so we will continue uh, to look at ways of offering different programs or new programs for our students uh, to en engage in and to go to work. Next slide. Um, and the booklet that I 
that I shared with the board is the complete plan, but I'm going to brief, briefly go over it with one slide for you. Um, and so the, uh, as you see at the bottom, is pretty much our, our foundation. And, and we have agreed that these are four areas that need to be part of our plan as the foundation. We can't do the others without that foundation. And that's achieving financial sustainability. Um, that's multiple revenue streams, whether it's tuition, grants, and different ways to support students. Advancing operational excellence, um, which is making it easy for people to work. Uh, it's, it's, uh, we want to remove all of the unnecessary bureaucracy in getting things done on campus. Uh, the third is enhan enhancing university well-being. I talked about it being the best place for uh, students to go to school and for, and for faculty and staff to work. And then the last foundational area is strengthening reputation and brand awareness. Um, we think we're too quiet, so we're going to get loud um, about all the great things that we do at, at Clayton State University. The priority focus areas are in the middle, so there's four goals or four priority areas. Building academic and career pathways. I talked about new programs. Um, I mentioned the Master of Arts in Teaching because there was a need and we quickly were able to move to address that. Uh, we, we, we hope to do that in some other areas as well. Some things that are, um, that are, that we're discussing, um, is around cyber. We have cyber security as a graduate certificate, but not as an undergraduate program right now. So we think that presents an opportunity and there's others as well that we think would be good for, for this specific community. Um, student success and, and social mobility, um, we, our, our mission is, you know, part of it is helping our students transition towards graduation. And so uh, two data points that I will share. Um, uh, this, I, the, the, the fall of 22 freshman cohort, it was the highest cohort in success, meaning transitioning from year one to year two in 18 years. And so we look to increase that number, but, but we have to keep students in school in order for them to persist towards graduation. And so that's a focus area, that's student success. Growing enrollment, I mentioned earlier, that's, that's going to be important. And then the last is increasing community and corporate engagement. Our conversation today is part of that in um, sharing the new things that are going on at Clayton State University and our desire to be in and, and work with the community. Um, uh, we have several good relationships around Clayton County, particularly the school district and others. And so we're, we're, you know, we're making an extra effort to focus on that for the benefit of our students. And, and that concludes, I think that is the last slide. I think we have, yes, and, and, and so thank you for your time. Um, um, I was uh, glad to bring you some brief information about Clayton State, but we'll answer any questions if you have any at this time. Any questions for Dr. Lewis? Yes, sir. Uh, yes, I just want to thank you for that presentation, especially when it comes to education, which is key <coughs> to our success of all our students and our older students as well as in this county. Um, I know I've come over and spoken to you a couple times with your technology and your uh, dental uh, programs over there. Yeah. Can you speak to how those are going? Oh, um, absolutely, yes. Um, uh, so I'll, I'll do um, nursing and dental hygiene. Um, uh, first of all, nursing, our, our last cohort, and we have one more student to take the test. Uh, and if the student passes, which I think she or he will, um, we will have a 100% pass rate on our NCLEX exam, which is the nursing board. So nursing is strong. And, and dental hygiene, um, I mean, I'm confident standing here right now telling you that when students graduate, they're 100% going to get a job and it's going to have a strong income. And so um, those are uh, extremely popular programs on our campus and, and we will continue to invest in them as I didn't mention um, this, this past year we received a uh, million dollars in design funds from the state for the um, design of our Harry S. Downs uh, building, uh, which is where nursing is. And so we have the design funds and we're hopeful as we move forward uh, that we will be able to complete um, the remodel. Great. So thank you for that question. Any other questions? Thank you, Doctor. Thank you, Chairman. Chairman, appreciate it. Appreciate it, and appreciate all that you do. Thank you. Works Source Atlanta a regional update. Mr. LeBeau, how are you? Good afternoon. Doing well, thank you, Mr. Chairman, uh, Commissioners. Thank you for giving me a little bit of time to speak today. I'm going to continue on the discussion about workforce development that we've heard from the first two uh, presenters. So first up. Uh, 
So we have introduction. I'm Rob LeBeau. I'm the Managing Director for the Workforce Solutions Department at the Atlanta Regional Commission. Uh, as you probably know, ARC is the Regional Planning Agency and Council of Governments for Metro Atlanta. If you can go to the next slide, please. You can see our vision. I mean, our, our vision is one great region, and we work in a variety of different areas. You can see the five goals outlined on the right. We are involved in everything from workforce development, aging services, natural resources, transportation planning, uh, economic development, uh, and, and a whole slew of different things. We have 240 uh, staff in our organization, and most people don't realize that our, our largest department is actually the Aging Services Department with about 80 different people. Uh, so we're involved in, in a variety of different things. But I'm here today to talk about workforce development. Next slide. Talk a little bit first about some of the demographics that's affecting workforce development in the region. If you look over the last 20 years, Metro Atlanta has the third highest total growth in population in the country with over 2 million people coming to Metro Atlanta just behind Dallas and Houston. Next slide, please. You'll see that puts us at number six for the largest, uh, sixth largest metropolitan area within the United States, right behind New York, Los Angeles, Chicago, Dallas, and Houston, and then Atlanta. We're basically virtually tied with Washington, D.C., Philadelphia, Miami, all about the same at about 6 million people currently. Next slide, please. Where do we project this going? By 2050, we will continue to grow and add about another 2 million people to the metro Atlanta area. And that's the top line. The bottom line are the jobs. So we're at about 3.7 million now. We will continue to grow to about 4.5 million. So our growth in jobs is not quite as at the same rate as our growth in population. Next slide, please. What's interesting when you think about growth in population, there's really only two ways that a population of an area grows. One is natural increase, which is new kids, the amount of babies being born. The other is in migration, how many people are moving to your community. And a, a global phenomenon in developed countries is, it, is that we are having fewer and fewer babies. We are actually at a point in the world where we are not um, having enough new kids to replace the parents. And that is certainly true within the United States and with Metro Atlanta. So what you see on that bottom blue side, that's how we are going to grow by natural increase, the number of kids that are being born. The majority of our increase in population in Metro Atlanta is going to be by in-migration, people moving to Atlanta. Next slide. Where within uh, the state are they coming to? You can see Metro Atlanta, of course, is, is where most of the people are, are projected to be uh, moving to. And you can see Clayton County uh, right there in, in the lighter purple, so not the, the highest growth, but the second highest growth level within, uh, within the state. Next slide. Economy as well has been doing very well within Metro Atlanta. The bottom line is the U.S. economy. You can see we were growing steadily. COVID hit, big drop for everybody, and then it came back up. Metro Atlanta has been outpacing the national economy. Uh, we, we took a big hit, of course, and then we came back pretty quickly and continued to outpace the national economy in the rate of growth. Next slide. Talk about unemployment rate. That's one of the measures that we always look at. In the state of Georgia, all of last year, we were at 3.2% in the state of Georgia. And then it dropped down to 3.1% for a little bit. It actually popped up a little bit. We ended March and April here on the slide, but last month I believe we were at 33 in the state of Georgia. That is still below the national unemployment rate, which in April was 3.9%. So that's an important measure to look at. But the other thing that we need to keep our eye on, in addition to unemployment, is labor force participation rate. What that means is the number of people or the percentage of people who are above 18 and are able to work, how many people are actually working or actively looking for work? That's your labor force participation rate. In the U.S., that rate is 62.7%. In Georgia, that's been 61.5%, which means we have fewer people who are actually looking for jobs or working um, than, the, than as a percentage of, of the 18 and above population, which means that is why a lot of our employers are having trouble finding workers because we don't have enough people in the labor force. That's one of our strategies is how do we get people to come back in and actually start working um, in jobs? Next slide, please. How does that relate to Clayton County? You can see the top line is unemployment rate. Uh, and just before the pandemic, uh, Clayton County was at 4.4%, jumped up to over 10% during the pandemic, and is now down to about 3.8%, which is uh, equivalent or about equivalent to where the, the national average is, slightly higher than the, the Georgia average, uh, but, but right about where the national average is for unemployment rate. Which is interesting, though, as you look at the labor force participation rate, Clayton County actually has a higher than national average for labor force participation. 
You can see how that has changed over time, but it is a little bit higher than the, the state and the national uh, participation rate. Next slide, please. So where are the jobs in Clayton County? What type of jobs? A full third of the jobs in Clayton County are transportation and warehousing, which is huge. It's as expected being next to the airport, uh, but that is uh, heavily weighted on that, and that's a little bit unusual. There's really, typically, it's a little bit more uh, equal in, in most counties, but because of the proximity to the airport, it makes a lot of sense that transportation and warehousing is 38% of the jobs within the state, and then it drops down quickly, and you can see retail and accommodations are the two next highest, but those are much smaller than that. Um, but what's good news on this, and you look at the three highest sectors for wages, transportation and housing, pays a hundred average of $101,000 for those jobs that are in Clayton County. So yes, it's, it's outsized for a typical distribution of jobs, but they pay well. So that's excellent news. And you can see management, uh, the highest wages are 146,000 utilities, 110, and then they drop down from there. Next slide, please. Job posting. So the other data source we can look at is how many jobs were posted in the county all of next, all of last year. And you can see the total numbers up there, unique job postings, 138,000 unique jobs were posted for hiring within the county. Uh, you can see the companies that are hiring the most, Clayton County Schools, two healthcare ones, uh, Clayton State University and the Home Depot. You can see those there. The occupations, not surprising, nurses, truck drivers, retail sales, laborers, and customer service. Next slide. So that's to level set some of the data. Um, I one of the things we do at ARC is we have a fantastic research department. And all of this data is available. I have I ran some reports. I'll make sure I share them with you um, and so that they can get distributed to. They're, they're full, thick reports that have all of that data on it. Um, just want to let you know that is one of the resources that, that we do offer through ARC. So, but I'm here to talk a little bit more about workforce development. In general, I'm not going to read all this, but what is workforce development? It is a process of enhancing and improving the skills, knowledge, and abilities of the workforce. That's in general. But what's more important and what we focus on as your workforce board is ensuring that those necessary skills and competencies are there to meet the current and future demands of the labor market. So what we do is we do not just train to train. If somebody comes into one of our programs, we don't just train them because they're interested. We will only train them in jobs that are in demand in Metro Atlanta now and will continue to grow. Um, and so unfortunately, we have some people who may uh, be disappointed that they can't get you know, a, a certificate in a certain area, but if it's not in demand, we will not pay for them to go to training in that area. Next slide. So as your workforce board, what we do is we implement the federal workforce law, which is the Workforce Innovation and Opportunity Act. This was put into place in 2014 uh, under President Obama. It is unfortunately about four years past being renewed, but it continues to get an annual renewal uh, just with the a lot of the issues up in Washington. It has not been able to come through for a full reauthorization, but we are working under the 2014 Act. And you can see the three pillars of what that Act requires us or really focuses us uh, for doing. Next slide, please. So in order to implement the Workforce Innovation and Opportunity Act in the state of Georgia, there are 17 local workforce development areas that, that have been established throughout the entire state. That's the, the state map on the left on as you're looking at the screen. On the right, you can see in Metro Atlanta, there are five independent local workforce development areas that are overseen by a local workforce development board. And so there are individual boards for Fulton County, Cobb County, DeKalb County, and City of Atlanta. And then there's the Atlanta Regional Board, which covers seven counties, including Clayton County in blue. And that's what I manage uh, through the Atlanta Regional Commission, our workforce services for those seven counties. Next slide. The leadership of that, first and foremost, is the local elected official board. So the chairman of each of those seven counties, Chairman Turner, as well as a mayor that serves on the ARC board for each of those seven counties, is part of a LEO board, local elected official boards. They are responsible for the fiduciary uh, work of what we're doing. And the other key thing that they do is that they appoint the local workforce board. And when you have a board, you actually have a uh, the, the Clio, uh, the Leo board appoints a Clio, and uh, Chairman Turner is our chief local elected official. So gets lots of emails from me to say, please sign this document, Man, authorize this, approve that. <laughs> <laughs> Next slide, please. Well, as I said, one of the most important functions of the Clio is to appoint the local board. So this is a required board that meets at least four times a year and oversees the work and the implementation of the Workforce Innovation and Opportunity Act. It is comprised of at least 51% employers. 
private sector employers. And then there are other uh, representatives uh, such as uh, coming from uh, the Department of Labor and Adult Ed and Vocational Rehabilitation and so forth. You see those listed there. We currently have a 25 member board uh, that serves uh, our area. Next slide, please. So how do we deliver services? Basically, we have two customers. So we, have, we receive federal funds. They come through the local elected officials. They are, it's overseen by the local workforce board and they direct us into providing services for two customers, job seekers and businesses or employers. And so what we do, the way we serve this for our job seekers, we serve youth, 16 to 24 year olds. Um, and we have a network of local youth providers in Clayton County, it is Project Outsource, Outsource Connects. You have two providers and Hearts to Nourish Hope. And I believe, I think Debbie's back there, Hearts to Nourish Hope. One of the great local youth providers that we've been working with for many, many years in Clayton County. And so they receive our funds and are directed to work with youth within Clayton County. Uh, to meet the needs of WIOA. But we also work with adults, so people over 18 years old. Um, usually there's some type of an income or barrier requirement as an adult, unless you have been laid off. If you're considered a dislocated worker, you've been laid off from a job and you can't go back to that job, then we can work with you no matter what your family income is. Um, and the way we work with them is through our network of career resource centers. And the one in Clayton County is off Mountain Zion Road on Corporate Center uh, next to the Costco, right? Uh, we're back in that in that development there. We've been there for many years. Um, I will say on that is that we've done some improvements on the inside. We have a, a nice building uh, or nice uh, facility what we're working with, but that building has been up for sale for several years, and it doesn't look as great as it used to. The, it's not being maintained as well outside. The landscaping is as good, and as you pull in, it kind of looks vacant. So um, we're in that lease for a couple more years, but we would wouldn't mind looking for other opportunities to have another location to work out of. Uh, we have about 7,000 square feet that we're working in there. Like I said, inside it works fine, uh, but because it's been up for sale and a lot of the tenants have, have left, it's not an ideal location. So if you have suggestions, we'd be glad to hear it. Um, next slide, please. So in addition to serving our job seekers, oh no, this is a, a, all the services we provide for our job seekers. So anybody can walk into our Career Resource Center. We have a computer lab that is open. You don't have to qualify. You don't have to have any type of, uh, of paperwork. You can come in and you can do basic things like use the computer lab, learn how to write a resume, do a job search, print some things. That's open to anybody. But then if you are looking for individualized career services, you can do an assessment. What are your skills? What are your interests? And if you qualify, we can actually send you to training. So we heard from Strive um, and others. We can send people to about 80 different training providers in Metro Atlanta um, if they qualify for our services and if it is an in-demand job. So if somebody comes in and says they want to be a, a forklift operator, we can say, all right, these are the training companies that do forklift training within Metro Atlanta. We will pay for you to go there. If they want to do a nursing assistant, same thing. You have all these organizations, whether it be Clayton State or whether it be a, 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 a for-profit provider or whatever, that, that does a nursing assistant, we will pay for you to go and get that credential. So that's the benefit of coming through us is that we have federal funds to pay for you to go through that. We also provide wraparound services. Uh, so if you need assistance with transportation or childcare, we can actually give you some funds to help pay for those services while you're in training. Next slide, please. And then for our employers, we can work directly with employers and help them with their labor needs. Typically with something like an on-the-job training, we can pay for up to half of their salary for up to six months if they hire somebody that's come through our program um, and, and they hire them on and, and have the opportunity to, to stay on as a full-time position. In addition to hiring new people for on-the-job training, we also help them with recruitment and assessments and the like, but we also do incumbent worker training. So say you have an organization uh, that wants to do some training for existing staff so that they can increase their skills. We can pay for up to half of that training cost to do incumbent worker training. And I'm going to show you an example of what one we did right here in Clayton County in just a second. So those are all the things we do for our employers as business services. Next slide. All right, so what are the numbers? So you can see these are all the numbers that we have for our eight counties or, or seven counties that we work with. So in Clayton County, in calendar year 2023, we had over 12,000 customer interactions. So those are people who called or came into our career resource centers or our, uh, or our career, res career resource centers. And then for youth, we had 1,400 customer interactions. Again, uh, Project Outsource Connects and Hearts of Nourish Hope. And you can see how many people were in person, how many new participants they enrolled um, that year. 
and then business services, how many different employers we worked with. So Clayton County, you can see by far, has the most of our seven counties, the most customer interactions uh, working in this county. Next slide, please. Um, Clayton County customers. So I wanted to end on a couple of examples of who it is we are working with. First one up here, we were very excited to work with Clayton County Public Schools and Perry, uh, uh, Perry Learning Academy with our welding trailer. We actually have a full-size trailer with six welding booths in it, and we brought it out, and we, had, we completed two cohorts of eight people. Um, and you can see the, the young adults there on the, the, the top picture on the left. Um, they went through a five-week training program to get a basic certification in welding, along with forklift op operations, OSHA, and first aid. Um, and so we've completed two of them with Clayton County Schools and uh, the Perry Learning Academy. And a really excellent program. Uh, they definitely want us to come back, but because we're trying to serve all seven counties, we have to move the trailer to another location and we'll be coming back next year to work with them again. Uh, we work with, with the Riverdale Fire, Fire Service Academy. My understanding is that Riverdale, Riverdale Fire Service is now under Clayton County. But we did work with them to do, the, you can see on there, their advanced emergency medical technician training. Um, and we gave, helped them by reimbursing them for $25,000 to help cover the cost for those trainings. You see 12 people went through and uh, passed that eight-week uh, classroom field training. Next slide, please. One other customer that came through our Career Resource Center, Ms. Angela here, uh, she was working in healthcare. She unfortunately had a bad car accident, broke her leg, could not stand and continue her job. Uh, so as she was recovering, she came through, uh, received some services through us, and actually is now the owner of an, of an, an assisted, assisted living home here in Clayton County. Next slide. Final uh, customer, this is uh, uh, Luster. He was working in a warehouse as a laborer. He came through our program and wanted to upgrade his skills and became a forklift operator and has uh, increased his salary and is now uh, very happy doing that job uh, in one of the warehouses here in Clayton County. And I believe that should be it. I'd be glad to answer any questions you have. Um, and of course, always welcome you to come by the Career Resource Center uh, over there on off Mount Zion. Yes, thank you for the presentation. And let me say this, that being the uh, Cleo, as you stated, I can testify firsthand of the great job that y'all are doing, not only in Clayton County, but within our service area. And one thing that you stated that I'm glad you stated and reemphasize is that the training is relevant to the job markets in the Absolutely. area. No need to train somebody to, if they, the job doesn't exist right. or it's too far to get to. So thank you for all that you do in that space. Are there any questions from board members? Oh, um, I also want to echo that sentiment. I mean, this sounds like uh, just an incredible service um, for Clayton County residents. I'm curious about the outreach that you do to make sure that the, uh, the residents who live here are aware of all yes. these opportunities that you all offer. Yeah, good question. And so we have, we're working with a firm that helps us do outreach um, through a variety of methods. We've done them, we've, we've tried them at, at bus stops and, and other areas like that. We've done flyers, we've had it handed out. But we found out one of the highest ways that we're getting feedback is through um, social media. So we, right, so we, we work with a company that will identify specific targeted areas, um, typically areas that might have higher unemployment rates or lower income rates or something like that. And we will do Facebook, Instagram, um, Google, and there's one other one. So they do a variety of whether you get these ads when you're on those locations, or if you're searching in Google and you say, I'm looking for a job, our ad will pop up about that. And it is geolocated for services within Clayton County. So we, we, it does cost a lot, so we pulse it. It's not all throughout the year, but every so often we'll do a campaign, and then we'll see that the activities at our service areas really increase when we do that. That sounds incredible, thank you. Great. Any other questions? Thank you. Mr. All right. Thank you. Appreciate it. All right. You have a great day. All right. Next up is Human Resources Benefits Plan 2025. Ms. Samples. Good evening, Chairman, Vice Chair, Commissioner Hambrick, Commissioner Reeves, and good evening to our Clayton County citizens. I want to introduce uh, Human Resources Manager Angela Woods. I know the board knows Ms. Woods, but I want to introduce her to our newest commissioner. Um, 
Ms. Woods actually is responsible for the day-to-day -day operations of our benefits and workers' compensation uh, division. We are currently in benefits year 24, and we have already begun the planning process for benefit year 25, which begins on January 1st of 2025. We have two brief presentations to inform the board on the direction that we would like to take for benefits year 25. If the board has no objections to our direction, we will move forward with the next steps, which include getting the contract presented to legal for review, and subsequently, CPO Rogers will present the contracts to the board for approval. We're not asking for a vote on anything uh, this evening. We just want to uh, inform the board the direction that we want to go in, go in and get feedback um, from the board. Now, we do have another presentation for our self-funded component of our benefits package. The reason we're not making that presentation right now is because we are still in negotiations. Uh, the numbers are not firm, and we don't want to bring anything to the board that is not uh, firm. So we will be bringing that back to the board as soon as we possibly can. Our consultant partners, Marsh and McClellan, they will present the presentations to the board. Angela, did you have anything to add? Did I forget anything? All right, thank you all so much. It is Jack Thompson Hall and Maureen Rosa. Good evening. Thank you for the opportunity to visit with you again today. Uh, Chairman Turner, Vice Chair Davis, Commissioner Hambrick, and also Commissioner Reeves. It's uh, very nice to meet you finally. And we look forward to working with you in the future. On behalf of myself, Jack Thompson, Senior Vice President with Marsh McLennan Agency here in Atlanta and our Employee Benefits Division, along with my partners, Maureen Rosen, Vice President of Account Management, Tanisha Gamblin, who is a Senior uh, Account Executive, and then Rory Callahan, our partner with Brown Financial Group. Uh, we make this presentation to you uh, on, on our behalf. Uh, we're going to first talk about the Kaiser Permanente renewal. Uh, the first part of this is the commercial, fully insured medical renewal. And this plan covers your active employees as well as your pre-65 uh, retirees. Next slide. And then uh, the second one will be the uh, Kaiser Medicare uh, Advantage renewal. So this is the commercial renewal. A lot of words here, but I'll hit the highlights. You had about 899 employees covered as of May, and about double that in terms of employees, spouses, and children. We call that members, 1,651 members. You had a very challenging claims year in the last 12 months from um, April of uh, 2023 through March of 2024 the loss ratio was 108%. So for every dollar of premium that you paid Kaiser, they paid out a dollar and eight cents. And then in addition to that, you had pooling premium, which is the <coughs> premium that you pay to throw large claims out, um, and you also had administration. So when I say that the last 12 months was a tough claims year, uh, it really was. There were nine claims that were over 135,000. That 135,000 is one half of the pooling point. So in a fully insured contract, if claims exceed 270,000, you pay a premium for them to disregard that for the upcoming renewal. You had a claim over a million dollars in the most uh, recent 12 months. And so when I say it was a challenging claims year, it absolutely was. By way of example, if you look back just a year ago, your claims experience was actually pretty good. It was at about 86%, and so there were only four claimants that had, we consider high cost claimants, above 50% of the pooling point. So the original renewal that Kaiser requested was 19.3%. Their medical inflation or trend, and that's medical and pharmacy together, 
at blended trend or inflation number is about 9%. That's higher than it has been historically. Um, you've had, as I mentioned, about a 25% increase in total claims year over year. When we throw out the really high claims, it was still a 12% increase below the pooling point. And in addition to that, you've had a steadily declining enrollment or membership in the Kaiser plan. Our actuaries did the renewal. We receive the information that the carrier provides us, and then we give it to our actuarial department, and they do the renewal. And our math came up with a 16.7% increase. We felt like that was a fair renewal based on your claims and the plan design that you have now. Our medical trend or inflation is uh, slightly below uh, that of Kaiser's. Next slide, please. So uh, the initial renewal, as I mentioned, is at 19.3%. The increase is uh, $2,255,000. We had a, a call, a meeting with Kaiser senior leadership and your representative, and we were able to negotiate that down to 17%. We think that's a fair renewal. The benefits have uh, remained the same. We did benefit changes last year, and so uh, uh, Director Ambles felt pretty strongly that we wanted to leave the benefits alone. So the total negotiated increase is uh, just under $2 million. I won't say it's a negotiated savings, but it's a reduction in the increase that they originally requested of about $264,000. So the premium in 2025, uh, based on that enrollment, is about $13.7 million and then there's a wellness fund uh, of 150,000. I'll pause there and see if there's any comments or questions about any of this math or their renewal action. Uh, yeah, I do have one. Uh, explain to me how a lower membership um, results in a higher cost for benefits. They have, um, they spread the cost of administering your plan okay. over those employees and so the more employees you have, then the lower net cost per employee, um, and then the lower uh, enrollment that you have, that net cost goes up. And so um, it's sl slowly declined over a period of time. It's something that they've brought up each renewal year, and we've uh, uh, you know, negotiated with them on that behalf. But we also see the enrollment in the Anthem plan increase, and so we think it's a migration from the Kaiser plan to the Anthem plan, okay. uh, but hopefully that answers your question. It, it does, and the other portion of it is I'd, I'd really like to see how much our, our premiums have gone up in the last three to five years. Certainly, we, can, um, ha we have that. Our actuaries have tracked it for that period of time, so that would be easily Great. Thank uh, you. provided. Is, is the wellness fund, is that a plus or a minus for us? Uh, do we have to do certain things in order to get to that 150000 or how does that work? Yes, it's a portion, it's a, a percentage of the overall fully insured premium. It's uh, the budget, that one, along with the wellness budget with Anthem as well. And it really funds a lot of the wellness activities that the Human Resources Department has grown over the last uh, four years that we've been uh, affiliated with uh, uh, Clayton County and your, your benefit program. So uh, there are absolutely are some uh, very defined programs. We work with Director Ambles and uh, Edward Lance, your uh, wellness coordinator, and uh, Angela Woods and team in order to lay that out over the next several years. Uh, we also have a population health management consultant in the form of uh, Valerie Houghton, and so we meet with your HR team and help them plan strategically. And so I think I've answered your question. There are absolutely some wellness initiatives in there. Well, I'm wondering if it helps to decrease some of these numbers, some of the higher costs. Well, they did. Uh, they lowered it from 190000 to 150000 in this most recent um, um, renewal period. Mm -hmm. And so um, there was, I think that's a corporate initiative on Kaiser's behalf 
They look at the uh, overall risk. They look at um, the client, uh, what's being spent, and they make those decisions. And so it was lowered from 190 to 150. Okay. Thank you. Um, very good. Moving on. So this is the uh, Medicare Senior Advantage Renewal. Um, you may have heard of the Inflation Reduction Act. Um, as it relates to the act, it becomes effective in January of 2025, and uh, it has implications on the Medicare Advantage programs, and more specifically, the Medicare Part D prescription drug benefit. One of the biggest uh, changes is um, it has lowered the out-of-pocket maximum for uh, prescription drugs from $8,000 to $2,000. So that's a pretty significant benefit uh, for your retirees. Um, it also um, will put in a, a payment plan uh, called M3P, which will allow Medicare members who receive Part D drugs to spread their payments out for those drugs over a 12-month period of time. So um, literally, if it was a $600 medication and they had to pay for that, they will then have the ability um, to uh, pay for that in $50 increments over a 12-month period of time. Um, the um, Medicare Advantage carriers are having to make special arrangements in order to administratively uh, handle that, and uh, Kaiser is no exception to that rule. But largely, the Inflation Reduction Act uh, is a benefit uh, to the retirees because the benefits are, as it relates to the prescription drug benefit, are richer. And for those that uh, need a payment plan to pay for their medications, that will then become available. Um, also, Kaiser Community rates um, their uh, Medicare Advantage plan, and that will uh, bode well for them um, in terms of the uh, requested adjustment in cost. So if you go to the next slide, um, the total cost is based on 338 enrolled members, and uh, your cost now is $826,000 for those members, and um, the re requested increase is 4%. Uh, so it will go to $859,000. It's an increase of $33,000. This is by far the lowest uh, renewal for Medicare Advantage plans that we've seen so far this year. So we were pleased to see that. I think it will bode well for the retirees that are covered under the Kaiser Medicare Advantage program. Um, and so we were uh, happy to see that. I'll pause there and see if there's any questions regarding that coverage. Uh, yes. Um with the uh, printout that we have, it has the Kaiser Medical for Employees. Okay, maybe that goes to. Hmm, I'm just trying to see, is that a mistake? Okay. Okay. Let me wait and see, because you're doing the, uh, okay. the retirees now. So. Um, so that's really it. Um, the Kaiser Commercial Renewal is a little higher than we had hoped. Your claims experience uh, would validate that. We feel like we've negotiated um, favorably for the county. Um, the good news is that the um, premiums um, are in line with what our actuaries feel like they should be. And then on the Medicare Advantage programs, 4% uh, is, is pretty favorable. Um, so with your permission, I'd like to move on from here and talk about the other, the second presentation unless there's any other questions here. Yeah, before you move on, are there any other questions in reference to what was just presented? All right, please proceed, sir. <clears throat> Very good. The uh, next uh, presentation is um, uh, regarding the um, You go to the next slide. Slide two. Thank you. So uh, we're trying to get all of these renewals to you as quickly as possible. So this is a series of three separate renewals. The first one is the New York Life, Life and Disability Renewals. We'll talk more in detail in a moment. 
The second part is the Delta Dental uh, Renewal. You have two dental plans. Yes, ma'am. Excuse me. Yeah, let me go back because you're going to something else now. Absolutely. But at the bottom of the page we have, uh, it has the Kaiser Medical for Employees. And for 2024, it just has uh, the dollar sign like there's no amount. And then you have for 2025, um, $13,962,000. So, so I can give you the numbers. We didn't prepare this document, but we looked at it in the back, and I can give you the numbers to fill in that, or we can have the document updated, um, whichever you prefer. Well, what difference, what, what kind of difference are we talking about from 24 to 25? Are you speaking of between the county and the employee? Mm -hmm. Right, because he jumped. The percentage. Um, bear with me for just a second. Can you go back to the previous presentation and go to um, slide four? Yeah, I didn't see it on the presentation, but it's on, the, go to it's the on next, this printout we next had. One. Right there. So the answer to your question is that the negotiated increase year over year is $1,990,000. Uh, and so the total negotiated renewal is thirteen million six hundred and ninety-eight thousand. Thirteen million six hundred or thirteen million nine sixty-two. Thirteen million six hundred and ninety-eight thousand dollars. Okay. I'll ask you later. Okay. I, I feel very confident in these That's numbers. Okay. And so, well, well, we have different numbers. I yeah. have different numbers on um, I, I think just we just need to true that up. Okay. So. All right. All right. So uh, moving back to the uh, uh, New York Life uh, presentation, thank you for being so fluent uh, with this. Um, all right. So to move on to the New York Life um, uh, slide, next slide, please. Uh, the short uh, of this is that it's a no change renewal. Uh, we met with your human resources department and we looked at your claims experience for the <coughs> life, for the voluntary life and for the disability and we were surprised, pleasantly surprised that New York Life agreed to hold the rates and not only did they agree to hold the rates but they did so for another three years. Originally when we wrote this contract they did a three-year rate guarantee the first time and uh, we were very surprised that they would be willing to do that again especially in light of some of the life insurance claims specifically so um, again the New York life uh, life uh, renewal is no change the rates are guaranteed until January of 2028 in the next slide it'll give you a little more breakdown um, the basic life in AD&D &D for active and retirees there's 2,627 enrolled uh, uh, employees and retirees. The annual cost is $288,000 and um, the county pays 72% of that and the employees pay 28. We also a couple of years ago added a public safety life and AD&D benefit. There's 1,104 public safety employees covered under that. Um, that cost annually is about $58,000. The county pays all of that. There is no employee cost there. Again, all of the rates uh, have stayed the same. Moving on to the next slide, the voluntary life uh, and uh, AD&D plan uh, pretty well participated in. You have 793 um, active employees that are enrolled and they cover their spouse and uh, also 98 retirees and they cover their spouses and children 477 children are covered um, and then there are also some grandfathered uh, life amounts you have a very complex grandfathered life program that's been enforced for many years New York Life honored that and just kept on uh, rolling when you left um, the Hartford so um, a lot of participation there this is all voluntary. The employees pay for this. $611,000 is the premium. There is no cost to the county other than the cost of payroll deducted. Uh, if you go to the next slide, uh, on the short-term disability, there are 754 uh, employees that are enrolled, annual cost of $230,000. There is no cost to the county, but uh, the employees pay uh, $230,139. 
And then for the long-term disability, there's 970 employees that are enrolled, 296,000, no cost to the county. And so uh, employees pay that full amount. Again, all of these rates are guaranteed for another three years. I'll also add renewing with New York Life and leaving the rates the same uh, creates enormous administrative efficiencies for your human resources department. Um, the, without going into a lot of details, there's a tremendous amount of complexity around that. And um, so uh, it, it was favorable, not only from a pricing standpoint, but also from an administration standpoint. I'll pause there and see if there's any comments or questions on the life or disability. Very good, moving on to the Delta Dental. Um, there are two dental plans, as I had mentioned. Uh, if you'll go to the next slide, the largest plan where the vast majority of your employees and retirees are covered is a dental PPO. And by dental PPO, you have the ability to go to any dentist that you'd like to, but if you go in network, um, their fees are lower. Um, this is self-funded and um, there is no change to the administrative fee. So the cost, uh, there's two types of cost in a self-funded dental plan. One is the administration to pay the claims. It gives you access to their network of dentists and you also get the discount. And then the other part of that are the claims themselves. On average, your members get about a 35% discount on their dental claims by being in network. And so there's no change to the administrative fee. Uh, you'll see in a minute that the dental claims were our actuaries are, are um, projecting that those are going to trend up a little bit next year. Um, there's also a plan enhancement. In order to bring your dental plan in line with your medical plan and the Affordable Care Act, uh, HR has requested that we increase the dependent age for orthodontia for child orthodontia, not adult orthodontia, although eight, 19 to 26 are early adults, but to extend uh, orthodontia for them until age 26, until they age off of the plan. The projected increase to do that in claims is about $14,000. So if you'll go to the, the next slide, uh, on the left hand side is the enrollment for 2024 again in your PPO plan. You'll see that the administration to process the claims to have the network to get the discount is about $99,000. Uh, claims we expect them to be about $1,515,000 this year. Next year we're projecting $1,660,000. So you'll see the total uh, cost goes from a million six fourteen to a million seven hundred and fifty nine thousand. Um, the premiums or the the cost of the plan is split currently seventy two twenty eight, and um, we're uh, increasing the county cost ever so slightly, uh, so that there's not a rate increase there. Um, and so the total additional cost for the plan out of the Seven uh, one million seven hundred and fifty nine thousand is one hundred and forty four, almost one hundred and forty five thousand. Again, that's due to uh, higher and than expected claims trend, and then uh, utilization and dependent age changes to age twenty six to cover that adult orthodontia. Overall, a, a modest adjustment, but a, but an increase of one hundred and about forty five thousand dollars. <throat> I'll pause there and see if there's any comments or questions on that. Yeah. Um, thank you for this presentation. I had a question. I just wanted to make sure that I was understanding um, for firstly, just want to confirm, like the Delta PPO is completely separate from the New York Life, like the three year. Okay. I just I was curious to see if any any you know medical or dental ever provided a three year lock in rate, but um, so I just wanted to confirm for the twenty four. 2024 to 2025 um, difference in the uh, dental PPO. The county is uh, uh, absorbing the cost, but the county employees will receive those additional benefits of having their de um, the dependents up until 26 and the other changes. So the, the employees are getting additional benefits and the county is absorbing that cost? Yes. Okay. 
Is there any details that I'm leaving out? Yes. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I do have one quick question. Um, as far as your, the, on the medical side, to ne can you negotiate a longer term rather than just one year? Yeah. Sometimes. And, does, and would that possibly bring the rate down per annum? Sometimes when you have rather significant claims, uh, the carriers are less likely to want to negotiate beyond a year. When you have um, better claims experience, they very well um, may be. Um, ordinarily, it's a year. Uh, we generally don't see more than a year, but, but that's not to say that it can't be done. Can we investigate that option? Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. I have a mind like a steel trap. Nothing gets in unless I write it down, so bear with me on that. Uh, very good. Moving on, the last part of the dental uh, plan is the dental HMO plan. This has less choice. The, the providers are, are uh, smaller. However, um, the cost is less. And for some value dental purchasers, that's a great option. And so, again, there's a no change renewal there. Um, there are 140 employees that are enrolled in this plan. And uh, the cost annually is about $38,000. Again, it's a no change renewal, so it'll stay that way. And this premium splits 72.28. So really, there's no change uh, there. And then lastly, um, for the IMED uh, vision plan, this is under a uh, rate guarantee until 2028. So it's a no change renewal. Um, if you'll go to the final slide, um, there is um, uh, the cost. Um, this is a uh, employee, this is a voluntary vision plan, so 200 and $63,000 of annual cost. There is no cost to the county, and the employees pick that up. And again, uh, that's guaranteed for another three years. So our intent here was to get as many of the renewals as we to you as we could to uh, lock them down. Uh, Commissioner Davis, as you requested for multiple years, yeah. we'll ask about the medical as well. And um, uh, Director Ambles, I don't want to misspeak, but I think we're asking for um, guidance or direction on this and then once we get the contracts back then um, uh, uh, Director Rogers will be back to present those. Is that how that would work? That's, that's true, Jay. I, I want to address uh, Commissioner Hambrick's question because preparing these numbers very, very important and as you can see on the agenda we try to give as much information um, as we possibly can. As the numbers are coming to me, they're not always firm, which is why we're not bringing the self-funded piece until we get the firm numbers. On, my, on the agenda, which I'm responsible for, you will see in 2025, there is a total of 13,962,872, and what's been presented to you all this evening is 13,698,056. I'm pretty confident to say that the, that the what's on the agenda was the first number. Additional uh, negotiations, I believe, took place, which reduced that number a little bit. So I take responsibility for not, after I got this firm number, did not go back and put it on the agenda. But we try to be very, very cautious and have multiple people looking at the numbers before we bring it to the board. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. You're welcome. Uh, that's the uh, total of our presentations. Uh, if there's no further questions, then um, thank you again for your time. Are there any other questions? Uh, well, are you an actuary? No, but uh, oh. people have accused me of that or worse. Yeah, so I mean, you it just, kinda, it yeah, kinda you kinda you present like an actuary. <laughs> um, I, I live in a black and white world and not a lot of gray at all. The numbers make sense to me. Um, but my wife reminds me on a fairly frequent basis that most of life is lived in the gray. So there's 
there's pluses and minuses just, yeah, to both. So, thank you. Thank you for your presentation, uh, Ms. Hamilton. Yes, sir, Chairman and, and, and distinguished board. First of all, we thank you all and the citizens of Clayton County for providing your support of our health and medical benefits. And what we are looking for is just feedback from the board. We want to make sure that we're going in the direction that the board wants us to go in. As you all know, it's always a mad dash uh, to get contracts, to get legal to review them, to set up for open enrollment. So we're trying to bring um, everything to you all as quickly as possible so we, that we can keep uh, moving. And thank you for your wellness, support with our wellness, because that is the single most important weapon that we have at reducing claims and so forth. So thank you all. And thank you and your team for all that you do. And to even to Commissioner Davis's point, this board's single, uh, the one thing that we want to do is make sure we take care of our employees and that we present them with the best health costs that's possible that we need to go back and look at, you know, how we can keep the rates low or small increases because we know inflation and that's not right. everybody's salary is going up, you yes, know, so right. it, when it comes to things like this, it's very important for us to be able to provide the best services to the employees. So thank you for all. No, we thank you all. The board has always been supportive and we appreciate it. Right. Okay, let's continue on with grand jury. Jury's pay, jurors pay. Madam DA. Uh, it's always good to see you back. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Tongue in cheek, right? Uh, <laughs> right. <laughs> right. <laughs> good evening, Chair, Vice Chair, Commissioner. It's always good to see y'all. Um, I think I came up in January, February, whenever budget time was. January, February, March, April. Listen, listen, y'all don't y'all see me maybe twice a year. I try to stay from over here. Thank you. Um, <laughs> But I'm back again. Um, when I presented the last time, I told you what the, the fall grand jury had asked. And that was a recommendation of $50 for the jurors um, and grand jurors, and also that the bailiffs, I think it was $15 an hour, if I remember correctly. That money doesn't come into my budget, so I don't know, you know if it was granted or not. And so when speaking to Madam Clerk, um, it came to my attention for the jurors and the grand jurors, it was not. I am begging y'all. It's been $25 for them to do jury duty and service and grand jury service a day for over 20 years. The current is what? $25. That's for both? Yes, okay. a day for over 20 years. I've been working for Clayton County since 1998. Hadn't changed. I, I mean, these men and women are coming and they're sitting and they're, in my case, as far as the felonies, they're listening to the worst of the worst. You know, we just had a child pornography. We can't indict in child pornography until we look at the child pornography to make sure it's child pornography. So imagine when you're a normal human being and you don't look at that sick stuff. And you're now 12 people sitting in a jury, and you're having to watch child pornography so that you can convict somebody of that, and we're only paying you $25 a day for five days of service. We're doing a disservice to our community. These men and women deserve at least $50 a day. And I'm asking you, I'm begging you to put that into the budget of Madam Clerk. I think we talked about the figure she's better with this, but it would be a, probably an additional $420,000, which would bring that part of her budget up to about $840,000 for, for those individuals um, that serve on the grand jury and also the juries. So we're asking for Clayton County, I mean, it's been 20 plus years since jury service has, it's been $25 to come serve on a jury per day. That doesn't even get you a tank of gas. Yeah. Now Is the pay the same for jury and grand jury? Yes, yes. ma'am. Oh. Yes, ma'am. And so the grand jury meets every Wednesday all day long. And that's been in part of the reason we're begging for this is because it's so hard to get people to come. And it's like grand jury. I can't do anything if I don't have at least 16 in that room. And I'm calling people and I'm like, where are you at? Where are you at? 
I'm having the sheriff's department to go pick them up because they're not coming because their main thing is I can't afford to come. You're paying me $25 a day. I can't afford. 50 ain't much better, but at least it shows that we're doing something. And, the, and actually, statute caps out at 50. So that is the max that we can give them. The statute caps out at, that, at 50. So we need to give them more money. How did you come up with your increase in numbers to 400? It's, it's up to the grand jury. The fall by statute, the fall grand jury must uh, set a pri or the per diem, it's called. And they can only, the max that they can do for the grand jurors and jurors is $50 by statute. So the fall grand jury maxed it out at 50. Okay. You guys can go 45, so 50 40, times. 35, but it's been 25 for 20 plus years. No. So I'm asking, goes in her budget, please give her the money so that we can show the citizens of Clayton County that we are saying thank you for the service that you're doing. Because $25 is kind of a joke right now. And for the bailiffs, uh, the grand jury said, I think it was $15 per hour. I'm asking for an increase for them too. Y'all set the, the price. If it's a flat fee of $90, $100, they've been at $80 too. I checked with um, Ms. Dr. Simmons, Dr. William Simmons, who is the interim um, court, thank you, court administrator. He said it's been that way for 20 years too, $80. We had a jury trial, because they called me at two o'clock in the morning and woke me up. That didn't end to 1.30. Those bailiffs cannot leave because they are responsible for that jury. So if the judge keeps them, the jurors there to 130, guess who's sitting there with them? The bailiffs. Another trial ended at 11.30. We have set up in that courthouse to 9.30, 11, 1.30 in the morning. And those bailiffs, and most of them are retired. They're like 70s, 60s, you know, and all they're getting, that flat fee of $80, and they've been there since 8 o'clock that morning and did not leave to 1.30 that morning. Okay. So they usually, yeah, because some courts, sometimes the judge will say come back at 9, but usually, or tell the, the jurors to come back at 9, but the bailiff is, is there at 8. Okay. And all, regardless, they get paid $80. You know, some days it might be that they get to leave at noon. But when we have a jury trial, <laughs> they're there until that jury is picked and some with some majority of my judges we start at at nine o'clock picking jurors and we go sometimes until eight that evening just to pick jurors so 12 hours they're getting 80 dollars okay. they come back the next morning and then we you know might have to continue to pick jurors or we we're starting the evidence and the judges will go past five o'clock in my case to get those cases done, especially those murders, those big cases. Like we have a huge case with the AG's office coming down next week to try. It's gonna be, <laughs> her staff, I know, we're all gonna, well, we don't have to try it, the AG's office is gonna try it, but those people, the jurors and the bailiffs are gonna be here well after eight o'clock each evening in that building. Is there a cap? Uh, no, ma'am. There's not a cap on the bailiff pay, but the grand jurors, it was $15 an hour that they put it at. So you guys can do, that's just a suggestion. That's their suggestion. So you guys can actually say, okay, I want twelve fifty, or, you know, we're going to give them $90 or we're going to give them $100 um, for a full day's work. You guys have that ability, but there isn't a cap on the bailiff's pay. It, the cap per diem is only on the jurors and the grand jurors. And by statute, the max you can pay them per diem is $50 a day. And that has not changed in quite some time. What's the recommendation for the bailiffs? Uh, I think that recommendation was $15, $15 an hour. The recommendation was that came out of the fall grand jury. Um, and that budget goes into the court administrator's budget under that line item. So none of this money comes to me. I don't write those checks, dish that money out. Am I right, Stacey? Yes. No. <laughs> I'm correct? OK, yeah. So, <laughs> so, so can I ask? You're just a muscle. I got you. I'm just, so. I'm just, honestly, and that's, the statute says the, the district attorney must 
bring that recommendation to the Board of Commissioners, and that's why I did it in January, February. I'm, I'm a little confused. So you're asking on the bailiffs if it's to go from a per day to an hourly? Listen, I think those men and women... I mean, what's your... I'm telling you what the grand jury suggested. The grand okay. jury recommended $15, $15 an hour. But you, I think they make $80 per day right now. So you guys can say $90. You can say $100. You can give them $12.50 an hour. You can make them hourly. You know, but understand, remember, I told you, they come in at 8, and I had some leave at 1.30. Now, how often has that happened now? I know, uh, granted, there's been Often than you think. 1.30 in the morning? Yes. Yes. I'm, I'm that I'm listen that's why there's a couch in my office that's why there's a shower now granted we have some plumbing problems sometimes <laughs> you know but honest to God because there have been times that I've laid my head on that couch we've been waiting the judge has taken has taken evidence that long that's why we, we sit there and there's sometimes that I can't sit there because I have other family obligations but yeah there you know in the winter time it's probably the worst because it gets dark so quickly but yeah so you, we've got senior citizens staying there, <coughs> and they don't sub out because usually a judge will have one or two bailiffs, and they are there, and their job is just to make sure that nobody gets back there to that jury okay. when they're deliberating, making sure that they're safe if they're walking anywhere and directing them. Gotcha. But it happens on my side more often than not because the complexity of our cases, we're not eight to five. We might go eight to eight, eight to seven. Just kind of depends upon the complexity. If it's something like a shoplifting, I'm not going to lie to you. I mean, yeah, I that's you. usually done like five, six. So, Clemens, you got something? If so, take the mic. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and honestly, all of that is just to um, protect the integrity of the of the jury. Because if they are on that trial, they hear this evidence. They the judges don't want them to go home. So. Because if they go home, they, they have access to their phones, they can look up things, um, they have access to the internet, things of that nature. And so that's why a lot, a lot of our judges push for them to get a verdict the same day that they are picked. Sometimes it can't be helped. They are re required to come back the following day and, and risk uh, you know that exposure. Um, but for major cases, which we are getting more and more of because we are trying to get through um, all of the, all of the cases that we have piled up since COVID happened, and you know this last year was our first year completely back open, 100% doing trials and everything back at the capacity that we were doing in 2019 and 2018. And so my clerk says, well, you know, Chairman, I was trying not to throw that in there, but my clerk says, well, are there till 1130, <laughs> 1 o'clock in the morning? But, you know, we'll, you'll see me in budget season. No um, <laughs> but it's basically to integ the, um, protect the integrity of the case and the evidence that is pre presented and their, keep them in a clear head when they are deliberating on these issues. But when you have... When you're talking about people that have child care, um, children, they're still sitting there, juries deliberating, they're being questioned at 2, 3 o'clock in, in the afternoon, and they have nobody else to go get their kids and things of this nature. Like, this is stuff that I deal with every, weekly um, with jurors because they are, a citizen, they are the citizens of the county, and these are real issues that they have. That $25... Uh, <laughs> I get cussed out on a regular basis because they're like, forget twenty to five dollars or me leaving my kid at school. You send the sheriff, send the sheriff. We have a lot of them walk out, send the sheriff to come get me, because they have you know obligations. And like like you said, fifty like she said, fifty dollars is not a lot more. Um, it's not going to supplement uh, the day at work that they are missing, but it it is something to show them. You know, hey. We, we understand we, let's give you a little something more but you know and I'm also taking the steps to let them know in advance hey jury service is a week you need to anticipate being here a week you need to make the arrangements for a week because we are back on open full time so these you need to manage your expectations any other questions oh yes uh, I actually wanted to start from the beginning so can you can you all talk about like how many jurors um, 
what is the starting number of, of jurors? And then for the grand jury and the regular jury, how many are selected? And then for each of those also, how many bailiffs are in the courtroom? Okay, so for grand jury, um, we must have, we must pick 26 grand jurors, okay? So you have three alternates and I must go in numerical order. Um, so those last three are the alternates. So I have to have 26, so I have 20, uh, three that are alternates, so 23. Out of that 23, 16 must come every Wednesday before I can present anything. Now she, this last time, I think you summoned what? Just for grand jury? Yes, just for grand jury. 325. 325 and for? we had 69? 69 show up. 69 people show up. I am summoning anywhere from 800 to 900 jurors every week just to get um, anywhere between 150 and 180. We have never crossed over 200 that actually show up. And on misdemeanor trials, if, if somebody asks for a misdemeanor, you have to have six jurors in the <laughs> box to hear a trial. Sometimes they will have one alternate. It usually depends, and this is just from my knowledge as SG, it, usually sometimes we'd have an alternate if we thought the case was going to be a week. But usually, most of the time, the case is a day or something, speeding ticket or you know shoplifting or something like that. So the judge would call up at least 12 to 15 jurors to come in for everybody to pick pick from. But usually, probably about 18 because every the number of strikes. When you get to felonies, it depends upon the nature of the felony because we would bring up panels of 36 to 42. Because if you've got co-defendants, you've got to have more people in the panel because everybody has the same number of strikes. So each defendant is going to get six, six strikes. So if you've got three co-defendants, I mean, that's 18 strikes on their side and just six on my side. So we've got to be able to go through, we go through about 42. I think the biggest panels we bring up are in panels in 42. And we might have to, 60? 60? 60, okay. 60. And we bring up, so we have to go through all that questioning and then get another panel because not everybody in that panel will qualify. They will be struck. And then you, till you get down to a panel, a group of people where you can actually, everybody gets their strikes and you can seat 12 plus two alternates. Because that's what, especially if we know we got a week plus trial. If we know we got like two or three witnesses, you know, we might have like one alternate because usually nobody's going to get sick overnight. So those are those little itty bitty cases, usually, you know, that don't last too long. Um, gosh, bailiffs, it kind of depends upon the complexity, however many, um, how complex the case is. I've seen some judges do it with a minimum of two on superior court, sometimes three, but le at least two of them are in there. Um, state court is usually one. They might have two now, but when I was down there, it was one. So, but the pay, the bailiffs upstairs are like at least two. And the trend this year has what? been. Oh, sorry. sorry. The trend this year has been. Um, we have. We have five superior court judges, five state court judges. I am the jury clerk for all of them. So they, their calendar runs um, together at the same time. So if I have seven judges going at the same time and I only have 150 jurors show up, then somebody's case is not gonna go forward. And if that case cannot be continued, somebody else is not gonna get jurors or those jurors are going to have to keep cycling multiple times so that each trial can get the, uh, the amount of jurors that are necessary to proceed forward. And that has happened several months in a row where it's almost first come, first serve. The first judge to get it and call up their, their panel of jurors gets it and everybody else is waiting. And I had one judge waiting. We waited until Thursday to pick a jury because that's when we had enough people back in the pool to actually have enough for to try a case. So that Thursday case that we thought we were gonna start on Monday and possibly end on Friday, we started on Thursday and didn't end to the following Wednesday. So those jurors, not only did they have to sit that whole week, but now we had to make them come back the following week because it was a murder case. And remember they had the weekend <laughs> to go and investigate that case on their own. Well, they didn't investigate it. They, they didn't investigate it. <laughs> but I'm saying, yeah, they didn't investigate it. But we, 
but we try to make sure that's why we try to get everything in okay. in a week we're not we're not saying that 50 is going to all automatically you know we're going to everybody that she summons will will come but i think it's going to help that number 25 versus 50 and you know hopefully the sheriff and the chief judges are not putting people in jail because i'm not going to sit here and lie to you they put them in jail holding them in contempt so that means on, on the weekends, our numbers in jail go up because people are mad about $25. Well, they, they, they are being subpoenaed, though. They, and, they're being, and they're being your points, they're being I, I'm glad, I'm glad, yes. Yeah, I'm yeah, glad that you uh, actually said that $50 is just a small little something going towards a positive, hopefully a positive outcome. But right. people don't want to sit for jury in general simply because they don't want to have to sit around all week doing nothing. Right. And then to your point, they get 25 or $50. It's an insult. But you got to try something, I guess. And right. we are trying, okay. we are working towards making that process better because um, the larger counties, Metro, um, all have gone towards calling and reporting, and we are looking towards going in that direction as well, which will hopefully make the jury amount uh, go down because <laughs> the only people that should report at that point in time will be the people that are actually selected. So yeah, we're we're on a wing and a prayer for uh, next week. I think we've got six or seven, seven judges, seven judges in superior court. So my five plus two, two seniors. So we're gonna be full running out. Well, one of them is being handled by uh, Attorney General Chris Carr. So we've got six, um, a senior judge for for one of um, the courtrooms. So we will be flat out running, and every single case is a uh, one of the seven seven major. Okay. So we're going to be good and depressed after next week with the number of it, we're trying. Any other questions? Mm -hmm. Well, thank you. Thank well, you. We appreciate the information. Thank so you. We appreciate any money you give them. I got you. Thank you. <laughs> I got you. All right, next up is project development, onboarding process, community development. <clears throat> Chairman, Vice Chair, Commissioners, good evening. Pull the mic up. Let me repeat it. <laughs> Chairman, Vice Chair, Commissioners, good evening. Good evening. Um, I would like, before we start our presentation, I would like to introduce some of the folks you've heard this evening that are working hard. I have with me uh, part of my staff that have been working hard to get our planning efforts going and and this evening i have our assistant director i'm cheryl brooks our planning administrator mary derby and our newest planner kayla chase so those are the group that um they hit me by now but <laughs> <laughs> but that's that's what we have so i'm going to be sharing this presentation and thank you ladies I'm going to be sharing this presentation this evening with Ms. Darby. Um, if you remember, on March 19th, 2024, um, the board approved a text amendment to limit our land use changes to twice a year. And at that time, if you think about it, if you limit it to twice a year only, that means that if we get a good project in the county that doesn't fall in October and April, there is a possibility that we might miss out. So what we did in thinking through the process, the twice a year um, plan amendment is to, main, is to um, make sure the integrity of our land use is intact. We've talked about you about the importance of land use. That's where it starts from that Permit land use before we get to zoning. So what we came up with is f figured out a way for commissioners to still be able to make policies, make land use policies and all that. So we said that if someone br brings a project that meets a certain criteria, that um, they go through the criteria and they score well enough in what we set it up, it is not arbitrary. It's something that has been put together, and you mm -hmm. will hear this evening 
how it was put together. So if they come with those marks, then we will go to the district commissioner that that project is in their district and make the case that that applicant can go off cycle. That means their project is good enough for the county. The economic development impacts of the project warrants it to move forward. So therefore, we'll go um, explain that and present the data to the district commissioner who we need his or her um, green light to go, to go forward. With a, uh, that means they will come off cycle. So, and that's how it's structured. <coughs> so, uh, next please. So I'm going to um, ask Ms. Mary to come explain the logic behind it and how we came about it. Thank you, Director GK. Um, good evening, um, Mr. Chair and fellow board members. My name is Mary Darby, Plan Administrator for Community Development Department. And as Director Ijiki was stating, for the economic development matrix to determine which projects the county wanted and which ones we should move forward outside of the April and October months for the two times a year Flume Future Land Use Map amendments, we have um, developed six criteria with thresholds as well as me a measurement criteria. One of the main things that we looked at is the cap capital investments, what we are bringing to the county. We scored this as a three, and basically this was in um, conjunction with the Office of Economic Development. We looked at the incentives from the Economic Development um, Incentive Package to determine projects that would, um, would be desirable to come to the county. We also looked at our criteria. We looked at our offering, which companies were offering the living wages and the amount. We looked at a minimum of $26.24 for living wages per household. Um, this was scored at 2.5. The 26.24 came from the MIT, Massachusetts Institute of Technology study. Our criteria number three was developed based on the number of new jobs creation that would come to the county in terms of employment growth. These jobs were not just any type of jobs. These were jobs that we looked at at the supervisory level and mid-management level. We rated that as a 1.5. We also looked at digital equity and technology-based economic development companies and what type of projects were going to be fostered in the county and which projects were going to support our economic um, entrepreneurs and our startup businesses. We rated that as a 1. In addition, we looked at the anticipated auxiliary type developments. These are our catalytic projects, the projects that would actually anchor um, businesses to other projects and attract <clears throat> new businesses. We rated that as a one. And further, and last criteria we looked at is whether or not the project would support the goals and vision of the county based on our comprehensive plan and our economic development plan, as well as some of the other small area plans that we have here in the county, we rated that as a one as well. So the total possible point system that you could achieve would be 10 points. And then I'll further illustrate in the next slide how that 10 points would determine whether or not a project would be expedited or not. So if the proposed development received a seven to 10 points system, then that project, we would say, ha, huh, this is a project that the county desires highly, and we would like to assist the developer in ensuring that this project is moved forward through an expediting onboarding manager, and I'll tell you who that manager and team is as we go through the project um, presentation. If the project scored between a three to six points, then we would schedule a working session with the applicant to determine whether or not we could actually achieve a seven point scale. If the project scored between a zero to two points, then that project we would determine that would follow our regularly scheduled zoning matters calendar. The other thing just really quick I just wanted to note that we would also be asking projects that are expedited to, for the applicant to provide a commitment letter saying that we are serious about coming to Clayton County. We would hate to do all this work and they weren't serious. So we would want them to provide a commitment letter stating that we're moving forward and we would like our project to be expedited. Next slide, please. So um, the slide that you're looking at at this point, <coughs> excuse me, it's um, how it flows. When we have a pre-application, the entry of any project, it's where the devil lies. 
if a project comes in in, in a proper manner and is well vetted, it moves smoothly through the process. If it comes in incomplete and it doesn't come out, it doesn't come in the right way, it starts with problem. Things being incomplete, staff and uh, applicant go back and forth as to what it's supposed to be. So the pre-application process for zoning cases, it's key. That's where we ask a lot of questions as to what is this project. So once the application comes in and is scored and determined if it's going to be a seven, uh, a seven to ten, or a three to six, or a zero to two, at that point, remember this this flow, it's when it's not on the regular cycle, when we're trying to convince the district commissioner to sign off on this project to come in their district. That's when we're doing that. So once we score it this way, then we notify the district commissioner. Then we, if it's seven to ten, we notify the district commissioner. Then if it's six, six, three to six, and we think there are rates, things they can do to improve it to, to seven at least so that we can do the project, then we also present that. But if it's zero to two, then we don't really um, push for it to go and where we just tell um, the applicant that they're going to go to the regular zoning um, month, um, cycle to the regular zoning month. Next. So we're going to show you something else that we are doing to do this. The premise is that we're trying to make sure quality developments come to Clayton County. When I mean quality, if you look at that economic development matrix, it was put together, and you're going to hear about it a little bit more. We went to the st stakeholders in the county that understand economic development to come up with those questions. A half of what we came up with, they gave us suggestions because they are the practitioners in the field. Say, try this, use this. So, next. This is what we do right now, which I would submit to you is pretty good in the metro. Our service delivery timelines, it's 10 business days to issue an application. When I'm called about a problem in our process, I start looking for what is going on, where did it go wrong? Because our, uh, our service delivery timeline is 10 business days. Except when you look at the zoning matters area, it's 84 days partly because of state law and how the calendar is structured. So when you're coming through zoning and you go through the process and get advertised, you're going to be inside of that calendar because that calendar is designed <coughs> based on the zoning procedure laws. That's why that calendar is designed. So this is what we do right now. But we want we wanted to if we decide, or if not we, if the project merits to be expedited, we do the expediting to attract developers to our county. If a project merits to be um, expedited, I'm about to show you what we plan to do next. We went into our process because we are data driven and broke our tracking into 72-hour blocks. If you look at the three 72-hour blocks and 24, we're still inside of the 10 days, except we want to approach it a little bit differently. That means in the first 72-hour blocks, you see what we're doing. We are, and we said here, this is a critical time where everybody's talking, we understand what is coming. Then we go to the 72 our, if, if the project has not been vetted enough or it's moving accordingly, in the second 72-hour block is triage. Everybody sit together and start figuring out what's going on. Who is holding up the process? Is it the county or the applicant? Yet sometimes, I'm not going to lie to you, sometimes we in the county might be delaying it. But sometimes it's the applicant side when they don't want to adhere to the county code. So on, in the third um, 
at 72 hours is where we finalize that application and uh, uh, the application request and process the permit. And remember, in the, the beauty of this is that every three days, we're talking to the applicant. We're not waiting on them to respond. We are initiating the move. Where are you? What are you doing? In the last 24 hours is where we, we make a final decision to abandon, the, not abandon, not to do it, but take them off our KPI. Because after the 10 day, and, and it's because they're not responding, then it hurts our KPI. But we have <laughs> set up, before we take you off of what we are doing in expediting, we're going to have emails. We have a tracking, our activity tracking, where we have evidence. Because when, when I tell somebody, I'm going to move you out of this stuff, let me know when you're ready. They're going to, the first place they come is call one of you. And when they do call, I like to use data. Um, data helps me to explain stuff. I can print the email and print the tracking. This is what we've been doing, and they're not responding. And if they want to engage, I will engage. So, and that is the beauty of the 24-hour block tracking, because it requires <coughs> not for us to wait for them. We gonna bugging them about their project. It's not easily done. And you're going to see how we're going to do it. Next. All right, let's talk about the keys to successful project for our onboarding process. Um, and this is through our pre-application process. So we've kind of updated or revised our pre-application process. So previously in the past, when we scheduled pre-applications that come through the county, whether or not it's a rezoning or a conditional use permit, we usually get the application and we schedule a pre-application um, meeting immediately. But now we've done something a little differently, so I'm very excited about it. So what we do now is we do more of our due diligence early on. So we get more information from the applicant early on prior to scheduling the pre-application meeting. And then to do that, some of the questions that we ask are, what is your property information? What type of development is it? What's your estimated total capital investment project? How much will it attract to the county? What are the number of jobs created? Um, what's the living wages? And um, whether or not it would support local entrepreneurs and startups and the attractions of new businesses as anchors. Next, please. And whether or not the project aligns with the county goals and visions and what are their workforce needs and um, at the start of the operations and what are the initial workforce roles and educational requirements? Will the company requires graduate students, students with certificates? And um, what will the workforce needs look like in five years? Additional questions we look at is what are your future educational requirements? What agencies or partners have you already partnered with with Clayton County? And will the project have access to MARTA? And if so, we're, we're looking at stops. And how will this proposed project be compatible and consistent with adjacent land uses that are currently here in Clayton County? By asking these questions early on as opposed to later on, by the time we schedule our pre-application meeting, we already have a clear idea of how we're moving Clayton forward. See how it all comes together? Mm -hmm. So um, next slide. Is that the last one? No, no, the, 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 this one right here. No, 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 this one right here. OK, this slide here is part of what we are doing that is new. The onboarding project manager will be me. It's, uh, we are doing one project as a test drive. And I'm beginning to see that um, I, just asked for this, I just asked for the wrong assignment. <laughs> <laughs> no, nah, I'm, I'm teasing. Um, what this means is that I'm, as the onboard project manager, I'm talking to them. Um, I'm talking to the applicant, I'm talking to the owner, I'm talking to the engineer, the architect, general contractor, and county reviewing agency department heads. Weeks ago, we had a meeting 
where the COO, the DCOO, and the county reviewing department heads, we had a meeting in my department where I went through this presentation. And one of the questions the COO asked them, they are buy-in in this process. And they all unanimously said yes. What it means that if something is going wrong, I'll pick up a phone and call them. I'm going to work with their staff as much as I can, but if I need something done or whatever I need, I want to be able to call them and say, hey, where are we? Because I need to respond to this applicant. So these are the folks I'm going to be calling. Um, the project we are working on now, when I told them that I need the name of the owner, the engineers, they asked me why. I said, because if I'm not getting the results that I need from the engineer, I'm going to the owner. I don't like to waste my time. I work fast. Let me know if it's on our side, we'll fix it. If it's on, on, on their side, fix it. The idea is to get the project done. But what this requires is that whoever is going to do I'm going to do this for, and I, when I told the chairman I'm going to do this for six months, he asked me, then after six months, what happens? <laughs> no, the six months is for us to tweak it. No plan is perfect the first time you roll it out. That's why I volunteered to do the first six um, um, six months, <clears throat> rather, to figure out what I'm actually seeing certain things that needs to be corrected. So, we are working with them and doing this. There are corrections we have to make on our side. Corrections we got to make, they're going to have to make on their side. And this position is almost like a 24 7 position because you don't know where they're going to call you. This project we are using as part of the test drive, they have my cell phone. As a matter of fact, yesterday at 6.30 p.m., they called me, and I had to answer because I logged in their phone number as the project name so that when I see it, I know it's that project. And um, so, and this assignment requires that you understand the three phases of our land development in the county. You have to understand the planning and zoning aspect of it. You have to understand the land development aspect of it, and you're going to have to understand the building side of it. So that's why I chose to be the one who vets this process, because I do understand those three aspects of development. So that's why, then, next. So. <laughs> she said, go ahead, go ahead. So this is the bigger picture of what you saw before. We have now expanded this a little bit to show you saw the um, A and B before. So you saw part of C. So when we get to C, so A is the pre-application as a middle. The B is within 24 to 48 hours, we score this application based on our, our development metrics. In C, we are doing real work. We, once we score it and determine what it is, we, we're informing the district commissioner whether it's three to six, if we think we can work with them to get it to seven at least. And in zero to two, we're telling them it goes to the regular schedule. If you look at the B, the moment is scored, and the person who's going to be scoring this is Ms. Darby. When she scores it, she, uh, she notifies me by text or email what that is. And in our system, we've programmed how we track this stuff in our system. So we go to see, we, inf we, inform, uh, we inform the commissioner if it's seven, um, 7 to 10, and we get their sign off then we know it's a project to be expedited. Then we inform all participants in the review agencies. And that's the last big um, um, uh, block there. Yes, ma'am. Oh, no, I, I thought you said that was the last slide. No, 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 it's not. Oh, oh. No, the, on, on the slide, 
I'm going to get Commissioner Hambrick out of here real fast. <laughs> so, so we have the names of, of the departments and the staff that are responsible for each one. Next. So this is a bigger picture. The first part you saw was the planning and zoning side. Now, the one the, you saw, um, the, one, the flow that's not colored is the land development flow how the land development works in our county. There are people who have their zoning already. They don't have to come through the zoning. So when they come through land development, we still do the vetting to see if we need to expedite them. Then the blue colored part is the building side. Initially, I said there are three phases of what we do, and our customers sometimes conflict the three. They delay me and I ask them, what stage are you in? So that's the big picture of that. Uh, next. Okay. All right. This is the fun part because this shows us all the team collaboration and all the partners it took to make this happen. So it wasn't just one person. So we had um, we worked with the office, the tax appraiser's office. We worked with the Office of Economic Development. We worked with our county attorney. We worked with Clayton State University. So we had a great team to pull this all together. And so we are one Clayton, and we're so excited about this process. And that should conclude our presentation. Okay. All right. Oh. Are, there, oh. <laughs> Are there any questions? I, I have only one kind of comment question. Um, if that score is less than, if they pass the score and they are going to, in a sense, be expedited and not have to go through the normal calendar, then I would put something in there to where they've got to start their project within 90 days. If not, all done, starts over. Because if they put you all through that, then they ought to be ready to go. Okay. Yeah, and um, Commissioner, <coughs> we'll take in. That means in, in, the, in the letter of commitment, uh, we're going to make sure there's a timeline when they're going to start. I will uh, request your indulgence to say that sometimes to mobilize some projects and hire the right people to do it, that, well, 90 days is three months. Exactly. So that is fair enough to say, if we're going to do all this work up front for you, exactly to do this. And another aspect of this is that when they sign that commitment letter, we say to them, we, if you think about it, they now have somebody on the inside, they call one person, and that's me. They don't call any other department. Now, they call me to figure out what's going on in there. So they have one person to be their internal project manager. So we're saying for us to do all this work, Correct. that in 90 days, we want you to apply for something. I it might not be, yeah? That's reasonable. Yeah. It, it, it might not be to break ground, but you start applying for the permit within 90 days. Is, is that fair? Not to me. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, granted, I mean, that should. I'll, the, I'll if, put if it in to start the project. Build, that permitting process should be started within that okay. uh, flow chart I'll, process. Okay. Uh, um, We'll put it in there that this project will start within three months. That's a good, I, that is a good idea, Mr. Njike. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't have a question, but uh, I do like the fact that you all will vet these Correct. projects before they come to us. Yes. Because so many times I'm thinking, you know, yeah. I don't even want that in, in my district kind of thing. So if you all, and you all basically know what each commissioner wants in their district. So uh, I, I like this process. So. Thank you, Commissioner. I like it even better if it works. So I'm, gl <laughs> I'm glad that you are the uh, test pilot for it that way, because I know when I get a lot of questions, I go directly to you as well. And yes. you find the answer or send it to where it needs to be. So this pretty much kind of cuts the middleman out. So yes. I like the part that you're taking direct ownership. Any other questions? Oh, I was just curious, is this, um, are there any other counties or any other localities that have implemented a process like this? I'm just curious what the comparables are. No. Okay. We think it outside the box. All right. All right. If there's no Thank other. You.
uh, no other questions. Thank, thank you. you for the presentation thank and you. looking forward to see how this uh, develops. Okay. ARPA allocations. Good evening, um, Chairman, Vice Chair, and Commissioners. I want to take this time to just give you all a quick update on um, where we are with the um, ARPA expenditures. And for time's sake, I will hit the areas that have remaining funds. So, But if you have any questions as we go along, just stop me and let me know. Um, so um, keep going to the next one. OK. So economic development has um, just over $500,000 left. And if you'll see the green column, the green column is the original allocation. The um, actual is what has been spent to date and the amount remaining, of course, is their amount remaining. Um, we've got 900,000 left for Alzheimer's Service Center, 77,000 left for the Senior Services Alzheimer's Center, emergency home repair, 243,000. Next. Is there a timeline that it has to be spent? She, she yes, I'm going to get to that in just oh, a second. Okay. That that's part of the reason that we're we're bringing this to you tonight. Oh, okay. um, information technology has just under a million dollars left. Next, fire and EMS has forty one thousand. Um, the medical examiner's office has just over five million. Next, communications. 5,400, Office of Resilience and Sustainability, um, 404,000. Next. Superior Court, 337,000. State Court, 386,000. Probate Court, 368,000. 368, District Attorney, 89,000. Solicitor, 636,000, public defender, 291,000, chief staff attorney, 125,000, um, 492,000 for um, bank credit service charges, um, replacement of lost revenue, $10 million. That is included in our budget for FY25, so that has already been obligated. And then right now, the undesignated amount is the $1.2 million. So the reason why I'm bringing this to you tonight is because um, these funds have to be obligated by December 31st. And we do currently have just over a million dollars that is unobligated and possibly some remaining that um, departments may not use. So they have to be obligated by December 31st of 24, spent by December 31st of 26, and the obligation means that it has to be an order place for property and services and enter, entry into a contract, subawards, sub awards, or similar transactions that require payment. If not, those funds, if they're not obligated by the 31st of this year, we'll have to return them um, the following year. So basically, this is just letting y'all know where we're at, what we have still available, and to let y'all start thinking about where y'all might want to re-obligate some of these funds to and what areas are important to each of y'all. What would need to be done to re-obligate funds, especially those that are in jeopardy of uh, not being able to be obligated? obligated. So, so what you'll do is just let us know, and then we'll work with the departments or whoever you want to make sure we can get a contract in place or get an encumbrance in place. Um, by the end of the year to make sure that we can obligate it and we'll bring it back to y'all to approve it. The one I'm, go back, uh, go back again, again. I'm looking for the one that said the Alzheimer's, they got, Keep going. did you say they had 900,000 remaining? One more. Whoop. Yes. Um, oh, so the Alzheimer's 000. Service Center, they were originally um, obligated 998000 They have 908000 left. So okay. not sure what the wish of the board is for that money. We can re-obligate it. No, I, I bring you that up because they definitely need to utilize that money because they are doing great, great work over there. But at the same time, I'm just surprised that there's that much money still left over. 
Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm going to check on that. But yeah, also, we need a, to have a greater, deeper yes. conversation with her in reference to that, and hopefully, she knows about that. Uh, yeah, that's what's going to be my yeah. question. Do these folk know that they have it, this mm -hmm. remaining and money? Yes. Oh, I'm sorry. It's the support for the nonprofits, the general assistance grants. So part of that is for Alzheimer's. Okay. So okay. Support support to nonprofits. Mm -hmm. That's all nonprofits. Or is there a specific like the local list? assistance grants? Okay. Okay. Okay, that makes sense. Okay. Chairman. Yes. Yeah, I do have another question with some of this allocation. Could is could some of this be used or portion of this be used for what Madam Da had just spoke about with the bailiffs? and the court jurors <clears throat> and court reporters uh, yes. correct That's so we have already right. um y'all reallocated the right. money for the court reporters um i think that was last meeting yes the last meeting we we took the court reporters from 200 to 400 so we did y'all did and that came from that. opera funds yes. right okay and so we could also begin to uh, obligate some for that bailiff grand jury jury I mean, could we check that? But that would have to be guaranteed in the next budget. It, it, the well, the thing is not sustainable. We can find out if that will time. qualify. The problem yeah. is that won't be sustainable. Correct. So we'd have to basically begin to look at sustaining for the 2027 budget cycle, correct? No, next 2026. 20, 20, it, well, it'd be through 2026, so that would be FY27. Right. So but the only correct. problem with that is if the board does not of pass course. it then you're taking money back away because there's no well, funded source to or you got to add to it so from this general fund yeah. when is this effective for the uh re court reporters um that's effective? effective now immediately yeah oh, okay. <coughs> okay and it was last tuesday night when that okay. budget I have a couple went through things. the medical examiner mm -hmm. five million that's for a bill uh -huh. That's for a building one. It's for the mm -hmm. for building and I believe some vehicles as well, but it's to outfit an, an existing building. Yes. Yeah, from what I understand. Yeah. That's well, so it doesn't have to be completed, it right. just has just to be okay. under contract. Under contract. Right. It wasn't, that wasn't a question for you anyway. Okay, um what's this bank credit card services charges? That is just an amount that we had um, put aside just to pay um, service charges and fees for credit cards that we, um, for online payments. Okay, and the Opera General Assistance, the last one, undesignated. The last one? Yes. Yeah, one point one that is what it, we have available to um, allocate out. That oh, is amount right is now, volume. as it stands, that we need to figure out something to do with that, that money. Yeah, because we sure don't want to give it back. <clears throat> okay, can we get a report, I guess maybe yeah. like November or something? I would suggest making it moving before Four November oh, okay. because yes. we have to have central services. If they have to get involved, they need to be able to get those contracts in place. So well, we need I, to do that now because I definitely right. would not want to be sending money back. Right. I would suggest us having some idea of where we want to move maybe in September. Well, okay. with that being said, provide this board with a list of options as to where that money can, the, the need for it, and work with the COO and look at those departments and the elected officials offices that they're but got to remember now it's got to be sustainable because it might not be in next year's budget so they got to make sure that we need to make sure that we have an option and that the money that is allocated is like a one-time payment to address those needs and we can do that but of course if y'all have any um specific requests please let us know and right. we'll look at incorporating <clears throat> that as well so is that a special, um, you know, some monies you can't spend in another pot or whatever. Does it matter with these funds? Um, we have the guidelines um, upstairs where we, um, the way it was originally allocated. So there are a few restrictions, but it's, I think we can probably do most of what you want with the money. Okay. Well, since we're going to do uh, the uh, commissioner's grant, next board meeting yes we are <laughs> yes uh, i'm just thinking maybe some of that may be added to oh, that yes. to the yes are you talking about the local assistance grant yes so we already have that's the, that's part of that nine hundred thousand. Okay. that is part of and that for, so for, can we bring that next week next uh the general the regular board meeting 
Can we bring that? To be approved mm -hmm. and make sure you send us a copy of what's being allocated prior to. But when it comes to this ARPA funds, the 908,000, I think is what it was, can I get a, it says support uh, 501 or those organizations. Can we get a breakdown as to what is going towards or yeah, is it no. even is it even dedicated or it's allocated? not dedicated right now okay can we get a list of those organizations that we could be considered to increase so it'll funds? be the same as the local assistance grants okay, the same right. organization well, when you send that form then we'll look at yeah it. will you have that ready because okay. i'm thinking yeah. it's already been through that process the the, the ranking right ranking. the ranking yeah okay mm -hmm. but for next board meeting please because there are um organizations that are asking for that and normally we have it about this time of the year Thank i think you all i think you might have already addressed this but um for the departments that have or uh the line items that have amounts remaining do they for the amount that it's listed is that have they already committed that that funding towards something or do we have like a, a list or so that is something on? that we are looking into now mm -hmm. to determine what that obligation looks like if it's for salaries or if it's for equipment or if they're going to be able to have to if they're going to have to use that money up by december 31st or have it encumbered or you know whatever they with a contract or something okay. um the guidelines do tend to change periodically so i know that's one thing that deputy cfo is looking into now right. can we Thank just you. make sure they know yeah we will yes, yes. All right, any other questions? Thank you, appreciate it. All right, last presentation is Hunting Reality Community Event. Uh, I can't wait to hear this one. I know. This will be a fun one. And short. Yes, we're going to make it short. Yes, yes, yes. Can we get these? Part of this presentation also? Okay. All right. <laughs> Thank you for having us, Chairman, Co-Chair, and Commissioners. We're very excited to be here. We're going to try to be short and sweet. First thing I'd like to do is um, introduce Ms. Alex Opts to get us started. Oops. Hello, everybody. Hello. You guys having a good afternoon? Yeah? Ready to go home? Yes, I know, me too. Okay, so my name is Alexandra. I, I'm a former Hearthstone Nourish Hope student. When I joined the program, I was struggling with mental health, anger, and legal issues. Thanks to Hearts, I now have the proper tools and resources to cope better and become a more stable, productive young adult. I am currently working with Hearts to support you facing similar challenges that I once faced. I am now set to graduate with my degree in social work in May 2025. I want to personally thank Clayton County. Thank you, guys. I personally want to thank Clayton County Chairman, Co-Chairman, and Commissioners for their awakening support to Hearts to Nourish Hope over the past 29 years. I appreciate the opportunity to present our Hunter Reality, a project started in 2012 by former students who wanted to create a Hunter House. However, Hearts challenged us to create a Hunter House that highlights the challenges and barriers you face. The experience has deeply impacted the youth, bringing us face to face with the consequences of our actions, such as drinking and driving, unprotected sex, gang involvement, and substance abuse. Overall, Hearts to Nourish Hope has impacted my life and the lives of many youth, transforming our struggles into a powerful tool for education and education awareness through projects like Come to Reality. Heart unwavering support and dedication has been significant in guiding us towards a brighter and more helpful future. Thank you. I talked really fast, you guys, so sorry. <laughs> so look, good afternoon. Thank you again for having us. Uh, look, we're part Stay of leading. Uh, so Dennis McGurk, Region Director for Atlanta Gaslight, but also a proud alumni of uh, 2024 uh, leadership Clayton class and so our class project is really uh, what you see on the screen and kind of working with Deb we were asked to look at something that would benefit the county and when we started down this road you know of course with any project with new teams you can kind of get into these challenges of which direction do we go and so when we started talking to Deb after they came and presented to one of our leadership classes, we thought about this young lady behind us 
and we thought about the risk and the challenges that they face with the decisions that they make on a daily basis in the community. Look, we've sit here and we've heard about jobs, we've heard about health care and everything. So we thought about, hey, what if we went down this road to, to show these youth uh, part of the challenges that they face, the risk, the reality of it, but then also educate them around how to make better decisions. And as we done that, we started working with the local planning committee, uh, the local emergency planning committee, uh, Ms. Broomfield that's heading that up, and they wanted to play a part in it, use it as an exercise for the fire department. And so everybody's building upon this. And so what the team will share with you is really this is a, a collaboration that we can carry on for years to come, long after we're gone. Uh, and there is folks already looking at Clayton County going, how do we get this? And it hasn't even started yet. I was in a meeting and had people from Gwinnett and Cobb asking about this particular project. So with that, I'll turn it over to Dr. Murrell. Hello, how are y'all doing? Good, Good evening. Um, I'm Doral Morrow. I'm an administrative director at Southern Regional Medical Center. Um, so the haunting reality has uh, several themes, like each theme gives a vivid depiction of uh, what happens when children make, when teens make choices, you know, that are not good for them. So as Dennis alluded to, if there's a car accident, you're going to see the car accident, you're going to see the fire, you're going to see people pulling bodies out. They're going to have to understand, you know, they're going to see it. It's also fun and engaging, but the most important part um, really is that the teens decide the theme. And uh, when we presented this before, um, the teens have actually um, come up to me after this and the things that they were um, talking about that we should make it around the project were not things that we thought we were thinking about. They had different ideas about it. And so it's been very helpful to us and I do believe um, it'll be an experience that will carry on in Clayton County for some time. Okay, you're up next. Okay, so we've done this project before, but then a little bit before COVID, my staff was so overwhelmed and, and, and stuff and we couldn't pull it together. Our building, we're renovating it and doing everything so we didn't have the space. So when Leadership Clayton came along, we were like, hey, if you guys can really help us pull this together, this will be able to go on forever. And it's really driven by the kids. If you guys will go to, if you could please go to the next slide, thank you. So it really creates leadership skills, the youth, um, like all this makeup, these youth are learning how to do that. Um, they are the actors, they, they research teen suicide and they come up with stats and they talk to the people and then they reach out to the nonprofits and say, who's doing this, who's doing that, please come and be at this event. So the event starts off with the firefighters, <clears throat> we have wrecked cars this year, Atlanta Gas Light is hosting it, so we're gonna have some fire going on this year, it's kind of exciting and stuff, and they actually use it as an exercise for the fire department, like Dennis was saying, but the kids really get impacted where they're pulling people out, they put them in the ambulance, they go away. We're gonna have people coming in and demonstrating how to use Narcan and, and giving Narcan away. And all of this is a team of youth that we empower to be those ambassadors, and then they can go out. It's not a one-time event, one and done. These kids get connected with hearts, with all the other non profits it's not just hearts involved in this all these other people to be mentored to say I'm noticing my friends depressed I don't know you know she might be thinking about suicide or maybe she said that or I see that there's some signs of drugs or I'm having an issue and a problem and they have somewhere to go where there are people that they feel safe it's a fun thing. The kids came like, we want to do a haunted house, Miss Debbie. I said, no, you can't just do a haunted house. Come on, guys, let's put this together. And I don't know if any of you guys got to go to the previous ones or not, but this one's going to be the biggest and the best, and it's going to be ongoing. It's driven by the youth. They create it. They're there and they run it, and it's something we want your input. If you can go to the next, kind of like our ask. Um, Okay, this is talking about the impact, which is what I just was doing. We can go to the next. We're trying to move along. Okay. 
All right, so we want you guys to help support us. Um, we want you to tell us who we need to talk to, make sure we include everybody and anybody that wants to be in the program. We want you to help us promote it. Who is out here that will be business and help us sponsor it? Um, there, we sell tickets, but that's not where we want to make our money. We want to get sponsorships. <clears throat> Nobody is turned away. We, we give away more tickets than we, we actually sell, but we need that funding to get everything. It is a fundraiser. Part of the funds, a percentage of the funds, the youth get to decide to do a project with some of the other um, nonprofits. So it's not like it's just hearts, um, but it, it's something that if they feel real strongly about teen suicide and they worked with this agency and they're really excited about a program they're doing or they just want to donate that money, maybe they want to make to where Narcan is available to everybody and anybody, they get to be empowered to put that in. They also get to decide the money that is raised from four hearts as well can go to what they want another project to be. So it's it's very much driven by the needs, the wants, and, and it teaches these kids that they can make decisions, that they can help look after each other, that they can be empowered, they can research, they can do whatever it is. It just kind of fits in together. Those of you who have, you've all known me for quite a while, some of you 29 years now and stuff, is that we we just always want to connect everything and support and really, you know, encouraging so I can step out of the way and watch what the youth do. And that's what that's what this is. We just kind of guided them and they just created this and now leadership claim. The, the thing about this is, is these guys are working so hard with us and, and stuff that this is going to be just a well-oiled machine and we're going to be able to do it every year, a little bit bigger, a little bit better. All right, I'll be quiet unless you have a state, state, we tried to rush. Did you state your name when you came up for no. the clerk? Please. Deborah Anglin, hearts right. to nourish hope. All right, all right. <laughs> so two things. Oh, Miss yes. Tina, you didn't have anything? Um, well, I can add. Okay. Um, so I'm Tina Howard. Um, I work for Clayton County, and I want to thank you all for allowing me to participate in Leadership Clayton. Uh, it's been a wonderful experience. Uh, with this project, I think we're asking the county to assist us with advertising. So we would like the communications department to come and maybe video some of the uh, activities that are going on. We would like the police and fire to participate. We would like economic development to assist us with um, accessing those businesses or approaching those businesses that would support uh, this effort. Well, and I, so, I'm, I'm sorry to cut you off. Oh, well, we have different levels of sponsorships, and so that will allow them to buy the makeup and supplies. That would allow them to um, uh, not only uh, uh, buy the tickets, building the materials, right. So each of this, these areas um, at uh, Atlanta Gas Light requires um, the kids to build props. And so the spinning wheel, the makeup, the costumes, all of those things uh, will cost. And so that's where the businesses and their donations will be. Your eyes are lit up when you're talking about the costumes and whatnot. Oh. You're going to be dressed up. <laughs> uh -huh. Everybody watch the screen. Go ahead and hit our Did you, uh, have, yeah, th that. that's have you uh, spoken, of course, I'm sure you have, to the chamber? About getting those this, well, Leadership Clayton is a part of the chamber, and okay, we presented so this to at a luncheon, at a chamber luncheon, and we did get some support from from that effort as well. And of course, we'll do our part because it's educational. We need yes. to put out that information. But have you spoken to the school system as well? That's our next stop. Next right. stop. All right, we'll be on the same page. <laughs> uh, and I remember this going back. You've done this a long, long time ago. Yeah. Go back to that first first group picture. Right there. No, I'm trying to f figure out who this young lady is on the front row here. Oh, <laughs> no. Actually, that isn't me. That's my sister. That's your sister. <laughs> I, I was about to say, she, it does look, it does look, it does look like you. Oh, okay. Really All right. Thank you. Well, that one, she's in the, the first one. But, um, oh, okay. But yeah, in, in fact, I think Courtney, your um, clerk. Your clerk, she was one of our, our kids, and she helped with this one of the first years. I'm pretty sure her and her brother Terrence 
um, who does all kinds of video and stuff like that. Go to like the podium. That. Yeah. Okay, speaking of, oh, you're finished. Okay. Yeah. I won't make you go to the podium. <laughs> uh, you have a question? Oh, yes. I was just curious if you all had reached out to the Clayton County Health Department. I know in addition to the, the Narcan um, device, they also have, I think, yes. fentanyl test strips. Yes, and they'll they'll be there with all their services, and that's really what we're trying to do. Is is you ask a young person like, do you know about the health department? What they do, and they don't majority of them don't have a clue. So we're trying to make all those connections. So that's what we want you guys to do. Who do you know that we need to include? We don't want to leave anybody out. It's it's a community thing, and we really really need to get that, yeah, that word out. A, so we save. And our that's babies. a good point, Commissioner May, because the health department could play a big, big role in this as well. And I just so happen to be the chair of the of the board of health. So all right, uh, there we go. Please call. Uh, please call. I don't know the new people. Anybody. I don't know the new people. So right. yes, if just, you, yeah, just whatever you need, right. let me know. And we'll All make right. sure that we get it. I'm sorry, what? The date. Oh, the date is October 25th and 26th. It's on there. And it's going to be at Atlanta Gaslight. So you guys can come out. We'd love for you to talk to our kids. We'd love for you to be there that night and say something and, and, and just like mingle. You, I know you guys do know this, but one of the most powerful things in these young people's lives is to meet you guys is to be able to talk to you i can remember when we very first started we took some people down to john lewis's office and it was during where he needed to leave to go to the something in washington and those kids were talking to him and his aide kept coming in and going we have to leave and he said no and those kids today i mean this was this was probably well over 20 years ago and the kids that we still talk to will never forget that and then when we went up to congressman scott's when we went to washington it was the same thing he was leaving to come down here we had trouble with the bus he waited and saw them so that interaction the the when lavinia jackson was the superintendent and stuff so and and you guys too when you guys come and visit and talk to our kids and take those pictures that we have and stuff that is so impactful forever in their lives so we really want you guys to be involved as much as you want so we'll put a hammer in your hand yes yes that would be great and I, I know I'm sure that at least one of us will show up in our Willy Wonka costume <laughs> there we go yes oh, yeah, we'll put, we'll put you in makeup <laughs> We, we, we. And if you say, like, this is, these are professional makeup artists that come and work with us. Show that. It, can you get to the I last have a quick picture? Question, uh, yes. Debbie no. Tina, one of you, uh, yeah. regarding uh, staff for the county. Are you all asking us to uh, get the staff for the I county? Are you all going to uh, no, contact they were, commu uh, communications? Uh, Fire department, police yes, department. So now we have the flyer. Uh, I wanted to send it out to the different department heads and ask for their support. Okay. I wasn't sure if it was uh, required to get um, on the board agenda for adoption, but we just um, wanted to reach out first to the department heads and get their buy-in. Yeah, because the fire, the, the public safety folks, they're good. They got community mm -hmm. uh, affairs units. Yeah, and we, you, uh, usually you just ask them to show up, and they're, right. they're and usually they would, there. Right. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, I do. Sorry, I do have one other question. It might be to Commissioner Hambrick or, or Chairman Turner, which is, isn't there a workforce development group that um, is training young folks to do building, as far as well, construction? There's some welding stuff going on that yes, we're associated sense. with mm -hmm. through okay. through the Atlanta Regional Commission. Um, there's I not a youth build here. I thought there here. was one locally. I don't know. Here. Commissioner Hammer, do you yeah. know of one? Uh, yes. Well, there is a, a group um, that we met with, a young a lady that trains uh, in the, heavy equipment. Well, I know they have equipment, Ascension but they're doing neighbor. something with so construction as well. Yeah. Ascent, we know Ascension. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yes, sir, and uh, and yeah. So Dr. Young uh, with Perry Academy, they are actually working with Construction Ready, and so yeah. he will be coming to my office uh, the fifteenth. Great. Uh, to kind of tour my facility, and that offer will be made as well to allow some of those students to come over and assist uh, as a volunteer effort if yeah. they'd like. Uh, but no, the staff for the event, we're recruiting that uh, holistically as a as a group. Uh, so we'll be doing the entire thing. Really, the only request is show up and smile. There you go. Sounds so like your kids. Where do your kids come from? Are, are they already yeah, associated with? 
<coughs> hearts. We go in, yeah, their hearts kids. We go into all the schools. We're going to okay. be presenting at the school board. Um, we even offer a thing to all the clubs in the school, like if they do sell tickets, two dollars of each ticket sale goes oh, okay. to that club okay. to support them and stuff. So yes, we're involved. And and if there's any other, even your youth committee. Youth Ruth, Commission. Commission. Youth Commission. Mm -hmm. They are involved. We're, we're going to get them involved. I think we've talked to some of them already, them. and we'll right. reach out to them. We just kind of yeah. want to get your blessing and, and well, support. Well, you're good to go. So, yeah. sound, sounds like the board is excited about it. Looking forward to uh, taking the experience. Thank you. Yes, thank you. All right. <laughs> and we'll have a, a dress rehearsal, kind of like in a little VIP thing the night before. We don't so want no dress rehearsal. <laughs> we want to be scared like everybody else. <laughs> So hopefully you guys like to be scared. <laughs> All right, is there any, any other questions? If not, that was the last presentation. No further business for this board. We will stand adjourned. <laughs>